City Council meeting for July 21st, 2008 to order. First thing is always on the agenda is a roll call and determination of the quorum. Jackie, if you would, please. Quaker? Here. Olson? Here. Kroger? Here. Hurlbud? Here. Patcock? Here. LaCroix? Here. Martinson? Here. Weifenbach? Here. Lekripke? Here. Chapman? Here. We have a quorum. Thank you, Jackie. Just a reminder, if you have a cell phone or if you have a pager, if you could please turn that off. The general rule of thumb is if, you're, if your cell phone or your pager goes off, you buy donuts for everyone, so it could get a little pricey. Uh, the other thing is if you wish to speak to any item on the agenda, we do have speaker request forms. You'll see them on the media table over here to your left. If you could fill that out, including the item that you wish to speak on, and then turn them into Jack at the end of the dais. That way we'll make sure to recognize you as that item comes up on the agenda. Next, what we'll have is if everyone could please rise for a moment of silence to be followed by the Pledge of, Al of Allegiance, please. Very good. As always, next item on the agenda is the adoption of the agenda. Are there any items that need to be added to tonight's agenda? I do have a 35A, which is a travel request for the National League of Cities. Uh, let's see, this was November 14th, and we will call that item 35A. Any additional items? If so, please turn your light on. Let's go to Alderman Sam Quaker. Thank you, Mayor. Under uh, items from uh, older persons, I'd like to add an item called um, uh, Haley Park and uh, Madison Cabin. Haley Park and Madison Cabin. And Thank you. Very good. We will call that, thank you, 56A. Any additional items be added to tonight's agenda? Any additional items? If not, the chair would look for a motion to approve the agenda with the inclusion of a 35A dealing with travel and a 56A dealing with Halley Park and the cabin. I'll move. We have a motion and second for approval. Any discussion on that motion? Any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion passes. Thank you, everyone. Chair would look for a motion to approve the uh, minutes of the July 7, 2008 and the special council meeting of the July 16th 2008 meetings. So moved. Second. We have a motion and a second. Any discussion on that motion? Any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion passes. Thank you everyone. We now move into awards and recognitions and uh, if I could have our veteran of the month, Frank join, uh, Jones, join me up front here. <laughs> well, it's that time of month again, folks, and, and it truly is an honor to recognize another Veteran of the Month. In partnership with the Veterans Coordination Commission, we are pleased to present the July 2008 Veteran of the Month recognition to Frank Jones. Now, Frank began his military career in 1963, joining the uh, United States Army at the age of 22. Mm -hmm. He served five tours in Germany, two in Vietnam, while in Germany, he trained the German Army uh, and received a shooting award and a German sports award. What was the sport in, Frank? <laughs> That's a little bit of everything. Okay, <laughs> very good. Frank spent two years in the transportation field and 18 years in the military police force. During his tour in Vietnam, he received many awards, including the Army Commendation Medal for each one of his tours, in addition to the Good Conduct Medal with four clusters, the National Defense Medal, the Vietnam Service Medal with six stars, the Non-Commissioned Officer uh, Development Medal with two clusters. Boy, there's a lot of medals. 
Overseas Medal with four clusters, the Army Service uh, Ribbon, and the Republic of Vietnam Campaign Medal. Frank is a man of many talents and a big heart when it comes to helping veterans and their family. Frank is a volunteer at the Veterans uh, VA up in, in Fort Meade, and he also runs the Comfort Room. Uh, let's see here. Frank and his deputy representatives order personal items and provide them free of charge to all veteran patients. He raises the money to buy these items through funds received through the DAV and other veterans organizations and through private, private donations. Frank also works at the volunteer desk at the Fort Meade and is the past DAV transport driver. He has recently been recognized, and I couldn't hardly believe, believe this when I read this, for 7,500 hours of volunteerism. That's absolutely incredible, Frank. Thank you. Frank is also the chief cook for the Rapid City, Rapid City Disabled. You didn't weigh all this on here, did you? <laughs> <laughs> no. Frank is the chief cook for the Rapid City Disabled Veterans uh, Chapter 3, which provides meals to veterans and their families on special occasions. Frank, you're truly an asset to the community. We thank you for your service, and we thank you for your continued support of our veterans. Thank, thank you, sir. Thank you. No, don't go away. <laughs> <laughs> And, and as customary, we'd like to ask Frank to say just a few words. Well, I'd just, I'd just like to thank everyone for this opportunity. So that's Very about good. it. <laughs> Very good. And if we could, if you have friends and family, please bring them up. We'll get a group picture. I'll tell you, why don't we do this? Let's get one real quick of Frank and I, and then we'll get the family up here. to recognize some long-standing employees of the city, and I'll ask uh, the Chief of Police to come up and join me. Jim, can you come on up? James Ronfeld has, needs to be acknowledged for his 20 years of dedicated service to the city of Rapid City, and with that, I'm gonna ask the police, uh, Chief of Police to say a few words and, and uh, tell us about James. Well, Jim Ronfelt has been a full-time employee for 20 years, but before that, for about five years, he was a, a police cadet, part of the Explorer program. So I think he started that when he was about 11. <laughs> I remember riding around with him when he was just a little guy. and uh, So anyway, now, in 20 years, he's made quite a bit of progress. He's uh, become one of our, uh, if not the, leading expert on accident reconstruction. Uh, he's certified by more boards and accrediting bodies than anybody we have, and uh, we look to him for uh, all of the expertise in accident reconstruction, so we're proud of him. I uh, just want to say thank you for having the opportunity to work for the city. Um, the city is a great employer, and I anticipate staying with them for several more years until I can retire. Thank you. Very good. Let's get a picture here. Okay, 
Tom, why don't you come on up? We're also very honored to extend another recognition of another 20 years. And Chief, if you want to say a few words and, and tell us a little bit about Tom. Oops, this is a, just spotted a typo, sorry. Um, this is actually uh, to recognize Tom for 25 years of service with the Rapid City Police Department. Uh, but before that, Tom was a police officer in Yankton for four years, so he's got a total of 29 years in law enforcement. Uh, I was in the Army before that. Um, during Tom's career, he was a detective, and for a while he was even a narcotics detective. So when he stopped looking like a drug dealer, we had to pull him back into <laughs> reality. And uh, now he's a lieutenant. He's one of our shift commanders. So we're real proud of, real proud of Tom. Well, the chief said to keep this short, so I'll just say thank you. <laughs> Very well done. Very, <laughs> Very good. Let's get a picture of Tom. And I'll ask Mark, our fire chief, to come up, and where's Mr. Knight? Where's Bill? There he is. I don't know how you can miss him. <laughs> <laughs> now, this one, I think, is right. 25 years, 25 right? 25 years. Very good. I've known Bill Knight for a number of years, and, you know, quite honestly, he is, he is truly an inspiration to those in, in the uh, fire department. He is always there uh, to give a hand and encouragement. And with that, uh, Chief, if you want to say a few words about uh, Bill Knight. It's my pleasure to, to speak about Bill tonight. He's one of the uh, three people who were part of fire administration that uh, makes my life very easy. Uh, 25 years, he moved into the fire prevention division in, in 1993 as a lieutenant, promoted to captain, and for the last six years, he's been the assistant chief in charge of uh, our fire suppression. And you know, talking with Bill, one of the things that, that make him most proud is, is what he's been able to do with... Uh, sprinklers and with inspections just to make the city and the, and the buildings a little bit safer in town. Thank you. I want to correct one thing. I don't always make the chief's life easier. <laughs> so through because of our inspections, but I cannot tell you how much and how much of an honor it's been to serve the uh, citizens of Rapid City and to work with such a fine, great uh, fire department. And it feels good inside to know that you've made a difference within the community, especially with fire and life safety. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you. Oh, let's get a picture here, Bill. Thank you, Bill. Thank you. 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 Thank you.
I just want to thank my wife who's not here. She's been my real support over the years. Unfortunately, she's working tonight. She's an RN at the hospital. So. <laughs> at this time, I'd also ask Tom Johnson to come forward, if he would, please. Well, for those of you that have watched and seen Rapid City grow over the, over the last, really, almost couple decades, you know that Tom Johnson has been a big part of that. Tom has served for 14 years on the city council. He has served in every possible position. He has chaired every committee. He served as president and vice president of the council, and, he's, and even as acting mayor uh, during uh, Jim Shaw's uh, uh, health issues. Uh, Tom is really uh, the history of Rapid City. He has as much knowledge as anybody I've ever known. Uh, his ability to recount and to make suggestions based upon things we've done in the past has been uh, literally irreplaceable. I mean, it just, it really has been a pleasure to work with Alderman Johnson, and we wish him the best. And for 14 years, he has certainly served this community well. Alderman Johnson, thank you so much for your service. <laughs> Thank you, Mayor Hanks, and uh, my thanks to the City Council. It's been a real honor and a privilege to serve as Alderman for Ward 1 for a number of years. Uh, I, I'd like to thank the uh, voters in Ward 1 for giving me the opportunity of a lifetime, something that most people do not have the opportunity to do. I will, I will say of all of the council people that I've served with over 14 years, I can't think of one that has probably enjoyed serving as councilman more than I have. I've, I've really enjoyed this job. Um, I've seen this community grow, and as, we, as I look over the community today, and I'll try and keep this somewhat short, Mayor, I, I threatened it for 20 minutes, but uh, uh, as I look at the community today and as I look across the country, Rapid City has a good, sound, solid economy. While you're seeing the economies, a lot of communities uh, sputter somewhat, and that's due because of Lo good long-term planning, planning that happened many years ago and when I first joined the council in 1992, it, we put forth many things in place that I think are really putting us where we're at today. One of the first things that uh, I was involved with was actually a committee that, that went back to the community and actually created the 2012, which has been one of the best programs that this community has had. So that, is, that has been one of our good ones. Something else that this community has done, and I'll, again, I'll try and keep it fairly short, but is we have secured water rights uh, well into the future. Communities can't grow without water. Uh, we've bought water rights out in the Rapid Valley. We've worked with the uh, uh, federal government and acquired water, water rights at Pactola. We literally have a plan from the Water Task Force that the council will act on sometime that will secure good, safe, clean drinking water for 20, 30 years into the future very easily with, with the plan that's moving forward. But, but we have the water, we have the capacity, and we had the vision to make certain that we had all that. The community also has a 20, uh, 25, 30 year plan on our wastewater plant, our sewer plant. Uh, we've made great strides in, in uh, our transportation network in, in, I know when Alan was first on the council, in uh, extending Katrin, Dri Katrin Boulevard, 5th Street, this enables us not only through transportation, but also opens up additional opportunities for retail and a number of things like that. That was absolutely great planning. I know that we've uh, worked with the congressional delegation. You're seeing uh, Mall Drive extension right now. And you're seeing Cabela's come as a result of that and a number of other uh, businesses. You're seeing the extension of East Anamosa Street beyond uh, Walmart, and it's gonna open up additional opportunities. This community, and this council had the vision to uh, put together a rapid loan fund program which helps in economic development, a futures fund which helps in economic development, a .16 plan which put in uh, $18.5 million immediately for extension of water and sewer. You can't grow without all those things. That's why I say this vision has been very good for the community. And probably one of the strongest things that we did through the whole thing was keep Ellsworth open and growing. Many of you know we made the base closure list it was uh, uh, an honor and privilege to be serving as acting mayor during a portion of that and working very closely with that. I had very little to do with it. A number of people 
amongst the chamber and, and council and, and uh, the task force had a lot to do with that congressional staff. But Rapid City has done a lot of things right. And for that reason, we're seeing Rapid City grow and prosper and things are very good. Having said that, let me look to the staff here. We have a staff that is excellent. As council person, I will tell you that I had awesome advice, very good advice from the staff. They were very responsive at all times and it made my job easier. I served with a number of very good council people, many of which are behind me, that uh, I, I think helped this community grow and I'm, I'm proud to have served with them. Um, I'm not sure what else I ought to say to keep things short, but, but again, it's been an honor and a privilege to serve as councilman. Uh, I appreciate uh, serving with Mayor Hanks, Mayor McLaughlin, Mayor Mayor Munson, Mayor Shaw, a number of mayors, and I won't even begin to try and uh, talk about the council people. And the other uh, other part that doesn't lead, doesn't usually get recognition is that we have so many people without the within the community that volunteer on committees that bring us good information and and help us along the way. So Rapid City's growth is a team effort far beyond the city council, far beyond the mayor's office. So I just like to thank everybody for the opportunity. Uh, to serve as alderman for all the years. Uh, I'll treasure that, and I'll take that through in the, my future years. So thank you all for your support. Why don't we do this? Could I have all the council people go ahead and come down? Let's get a picture with, with Tom and the whole council, if I could, please. Alderman Johnson, in addition to the resolution we passed, we do have a plaque here to acknowledge your outstanding service to the city of Rapid City uh, from 2004 to 2008, which is your last term. And there again, thank you so much, and we truly appreciate all your hard work and, and le your leadership through all, all that time. Thank you, everyone. It, it is very important that we recognize those, um, those 
honorees tonight, both our veteran, our employees, and also Alderman Johnson who has served us so well. Thank you for allowing us to take that opportunity. With that, we are on to the general public comment period. This is a time for members of the public to discuss or express concerns to the council on any issue not on the agenda. Action will not be taken at tonight's meeting on any issue not on the agenda except by placement on the agenda by the unanimous vote of the council members present. Are there any general items from the public that are not on the agenda that someone would like to share? I do not believe we have any speaker request forms. Yep. Very good. Did you have a speaker request form in? Yes. Okay, very good. Okay, Michael, is it Dudash? Okay, if you would. Um, now, as always, during this time period, we do time. Uh, if you could just watch the lights here, and if you could just come up here and identify yourself for us, Michael. And typically, this time, we allow for three minutes, and so just watch the lights when it turns red. Your, okay. your time is up. Very good. Please proceed. Uh, I'd like to propose a crosswalk at uh, 605 Steel Street. Mike, if you could. If you could just identify yourself for oh, the record, sorry. please. My name is Mike Dudash. Very I good. I work for the street department. Uh, I'd like to propose a crosswalk at 605 Steel Street, which uh, the employees from the street department have to cross Steel Street on a regular basis. Uh, it's basically a hazard because cars coming, they don't seem to want to yield. As a matter of fact, on July 9th of this year, I was about ready to cross the street when a teenager saw me. So he gunned it, floored it. I had no crosswalk. I jumped back off onto the, the grass, and luckily, there was a Rapid City police officer picking up his cruiser. He pursued that individual and got him. I don't know what transpired after that. But for the safety of the employees, I'd request a crosswalk at 605 Steel Street, because it's part of our job to go back and forth. Very That's good. All. Thank you. Additional speakers uh, for anything that is not on the agenda? General public comments? Any additional? If not, we are on to the non-public, and Michael, just so you know, typically, uh, since it wasn't on the agenda, what I would encourage you to do is actually show up uh, at a legal and finance committee meeting and talk to one of your, the aldermen here, and they can actually place it on the agenda for discussion, okay? We are on to the non-public hearing items. These are items uh, 3 through 56, the chair would look for a motion to open the public comment period on items 3 through 37, please. Second. We have a motion and a second. Any discussion on that motion? Seeing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion passes. We are in f on the public comment period for items 3 through 37, and that will include 35A, which was added to the agenda, which was a travel request. Okay. On item number 20, this is on the, the recommendation. This is on the parking plan. Before we do this, let me just uh, remind everybody, the motion on the floor, my understanding will be that we continue this. This is the recommendation from the Legal and Finance Committee that we continue this item for 30 days and that we direct the staff to hold another public, uh, uh, another public open house or public meeting. So uh, with that in mind, uh, if you have something you, that you feel that we should hear tonight. Uh, we also have a CM Ray on item 20, please. Yeah, I'm Charlie Ray. Uh, I just came tonight to be sure that this, uh, this item got uh, approved. And so I put my name down as speaker just in case. Perfect. So thank you. Thank you. And there again, just a reminder, the motion or the recommendation that came from legal and finance was to uh, recommend that another public hearing be held regarding the downtown parking plan and notices be sent to the uh, property owners affected by this plan. That will be the motion that will be on the floor. We also have a speaker request form from John Rathford on item number 20. John Ray Forth. Um, my, my, uh, uh, Speaker request again is protective, just like Mr. Ray. Um, I just wanted to say, just in our little block, which is the 900 block in Quincy Street, um, over half of the property, property owners did not have notice um, of the June 24th public meeting. 
and I don't believe that the published notice that was given is really adequate notice. I believe that you do need to send a notice to property owners. Property owners' rights and interests are being uh, significantly affected, and I think they do need to have notice. So for all those reasons, I urge you um, to give public notice or to give actual notice to property owners of the public meeting that will be held. Thank you. Thank you. We also have a speaker request form from Mary uh, Peterson on item number 20. I, I too will just wait until you have the, hopefully it'll go through with the um, public announcement and I'll wait at that time. Very good. Thank you. Thank you, Mary. We also have a speaker request form from Alan Barreth. Am I, am I getting that close, Alan? Also on item number 20. Thank you. I'm here just to represent the board of the Rapid City YMCA, and uh, we would look forward to your deferment and uh, have an opportunity to work with your staff and yourselves later in regard to our parking plan for the city. So thank, you. thank you, sir. We also have a speaker request form from Angela. Uh, is it Kegler? Item number 20. Angelina, I suppose. Uh, good that. evening. I'd actually like to wait as well um, to speak at the, the next meeting. Okay, thank Very you. good, thank you. We also have a speaker request form from Robin Eddy. Good evening, Robin Eddy. Thank you again. Um, I also, as a representative from the YMCA, and um, I also want to thank you for the uh, additional time and the discussion opportunity because the Y would like to play an active role in that discussion. Thank you very much for your time. Very good. Any additional? Okay. If not, the chair will look for a motion to close the public comment period on items 3 through 37, please. Second. We have a motion and second to close public comment period. Any discussion on that motion? Any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. aye. Opposed? Motion passes. The chair would ask if any of the council members or staff would like to remove any item from the consent calendar. That would be items 3 through 37, including 35A. Anyone wish to have any of those items removed, please turn on your light. Let's go to Alderman Ron Kroger. Item number four. Item number four, thank you. Alderwoman Deb Hadcock. Number 20 and number 45. Is that on our? Nope, not 45. Not 45 Just, yet? Nope, okay. not yet. Sorry. Let's go to number 20. Okay. Let's go to Alderwoman Karen Olson. Mine is a clarification. Um, I'm, it's not clear to me on item 20, uh, excuse me, item 19, if um, <coughs> what we talked about, my understanding was this item was not on the consent calendar, and I'm just trying to clarify. Why don't, why don't you, if you would, just make a motion to pull it, and then we'll talk about it okay. when it comes up. Okay, in so which case, then I would pull item number 19. Very good, 19, very good. Let's go to Jim Preston, our city finance officer. Mr. Preston. Okay. What number, please? Okay. Um, I just thought 35A should be uh, removed because that is, this is consent items and that was not approved at uh, any committee. That's fine. Thank you. Very good. Any others? So, so far we have item 4, 19, 20, and 35A. Let's go to Alderman Ron Weifenbach. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Number 24 and 25. 24 and 25, very good. Anything else? Let's go to Alderman Sam Quaker. Item number 23, please. Item 23, any additional? If so, please turn on your light. So far, we are looking at approving the consent calendar items three through 37 with the exception of four, 19, 20, 23, 24, 25, and 35A. Chair would look for a motion, please. I moved. As listed. Very good. Second. We have a motion and second. Discussion on that motion. Seeing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion passes. We are on to item number four, please, in public works. That would be Alderman Lloyd LaCroix. Could you read that in, please? 
Oh, I'm sorry. Let's see who was who, who ran the meeting. Alderman. Hurl Let's go to Alderman Bob Hurlbut, who is the vice chair. Thank you, Mayor. Item number four is uh, accept the Robbinsdale Park bike track scheduling <coughs> proposal as presented. And I would move approval. Second. We have a motion, second for approval. Discussion on that motion. Let's go to Alderman Ron Kroger. Thank, <coughs> thank you, Mayor. I just have a question for our. Uh, Jerry Cole, if I could, uh, looking on the attachment on on our laptops here, uh, the only thing attached to that is a lease agreement date of 2003. And I guess my question is, uh, Jerry, is this going to be open to the public? Mr. Cole. The proposal that the BMX came with was to open it between the hours on, I think it's six to nine on Thursdays and Saturdays uh, all day, eight to five or something like I think something like that for Saturdays. If I may, Mayor, please. Ori originally, when we did this agreement back in 2003, uh, we had that open to the general public, and I don't know what the you know the scheduling was, but I guess I do have some concerns because I drove by there about a month ago, and there was a sign on there that said uh, the public was not allowed on that facility. And since then, that sign has come down. But um, I, I guess my question is, when I, when I drive by there, I don't see it in use. And, and I don't know why that the public can't use that or the kids in that area can't use that when that facility is not in use. And I guess that's my question to Jerry Cole. Okay, Mr. Cole. Earlier this spring, the BMX um, came forward and wanted me to go to the track and look at what has happened and during the rains that we were getting the track was open and it was open free to come and go at any time of the hour one of the things that happened is that the general public the kids on the bicycles in the neighborhood literally destroyed the track with the mud they were riding up and down the track on the hills it took the volunteers hours to put it back together um, the second item is the vandalism that is occurring there at night uh, in and around this park and in the BMX um, track itself with the concession stand has been broken into several times. Um, and so the, they, the decision came to, okay, let's go ahead and close the track, put a gate on it, let's limit the uh, public's access. Um, and we'll see if that works. Uh, but the volunteers were spending many, many hours fixing the track so they could have their races on on Thursdays and Fridays and Saturdays and Sundays. So, okay, yeah, Mr. Krogh, you still have the floor. And I can certainly understand that. I mean, I've been a volunteer in, in a lot of sporting activities, and, and I know it's a lot of work. But I. But I do have some concerns, uh, and I guess my last question for right now would be is the new BMX track off of uh, uh, Omaha. Is that open to the public? Mr. Cole. Thank you. Um, that is not a BMX track. That is a dirt jump park and it is open to the public uh, during the park hours at all times. There is no fence on it. Anybody can go and enjoy that uh, uh, dirt jump park. The difference between the BMX is that these are official ABA American Bicycle Association races and that track has to um, live up to standards of the ABA in order to be a certified track and because of the public use and the things that were happening out there they were in uh, very close to losing their ABA certification. Okay, Mr. Kroger anything else? I lied, Mayor. I do have one other question here. I, what do uh, the, the ball fields and stuff do uh, as far as access from the general public? Okay. The uh, ball fields, um, Little League ball fields are generally closed. However, there are no fences so people can go in there and, and play on the fields uh, if they want. The Little Leagues, however, do have the um, authority to uh, request the people stay off of those fields. The McKeague field, the post-22 field, the 320 field are locked up, no access, no public entrance and exit, um, totally at their beck and 
unless the city council would override them on use um, for public access. Okay. Anything yeah. else, Mr. Kroger? Uh, I'll just leave it at that. You know, I, I can't uh, recall all the discussion we had back in 2003 regarding this, but, but I know it was a concern of the council members at that time that this was allowed as a public uh, facility, and, and, and now we've changed course, and I can certainly understand with the vandalism and stuff that's there, but, um, you know, I, I don't know how long their season takes place. I don't know if it's year long or whatever it might be, but um, it's, it, it, I know that track was getting used by the general public and now the kids no longer have access to that. So that's a concern of mine. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you. Let's go to Alderwoman Karen Olson. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I did listen to the discussion, two discussions in which the BMX folks were here. And I would just urge my, urge my colleagues, if we're not going to approve this item, that we continue it because I feel certain those folks would have been here to talk about their um, concerns and their um, um, issues. Um, if they had, if this had not been on the consent calendar. Thank you. Let's go to Alderman Sam Quaker. Thank you, Mayor. Also discussed uh, discussed at committee the other day was the um, the uh, issue of vandalism in the park, which is really the issue, in my understanding, that's been driving um, a lot of this, and is one of the main reasons why the the BMX track was. Uh, was closed and we did ask at Public Works and I'm not sure when Jerry that's coming back but we did ask that be um, that that be looked at uh, because probably one of the solutions could be is is closure of the uh, of the park after 10-11 um, at, uh, at night until early morning because that's when most of the vandalism is taking place and unfortunately the actions of a few are are, are causing a public facility to no longer be open to the public. I support this as an interim measure, uh, but I hope that the, uh, the long range goal is to open um, the park up again to the way it was uh, five, five years ago or so, uh, so that uh, people can have, have, that the public can have access to it. And I think we very need, uh, quickly need to address uh, the issues of vandalism in the park. And one of the solutions is probably uh, to uh, close it uh, overnight. Thank you. Thank you. Motion on the floor, just a reminder, is to acknowledge or accept the Robbinsdale uh, Park Bike Track Scheduling Proposal. With that, let's go to Alderman Lloyd LaCroix. Thank you, Mayor. I just wanted to bring up during the meeting that uh, the BMX group and Jerry Cole worked out the problem together because there was some concerns. And I believe they're talking about installing some cameras to try and help reduce down uh, some of the graffiti and some of the vandalism that's going along. And it's not unusual for us. If I remember right, we did we closed down the uh, skateboard park because of vandalism. And and once once you do that, then it starts improving, and, and people started policing themselves. And I and I think they've worked out a good plan, and and I think this is a good plan to move forward. Thank you. Thank you. Let's next go to Alderman Ron Weifenbach. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I, I happen to live in this neighborhood, so I, I see what happens here all the time. That BMX track, it, it does get highly used. And uh, after uh, visiting with the BMX people, and, and I, think that, I think that they have a good plan in place, like Alderman LaCroix had mentioned. And uh, I, I, I happen to go down to the finance uh, department and pull out their lease the piece that's in, writ in writing that, that these people are given when they sign these things and they take on these tasks. It's a monumental task to, to run a BMX racing track. I spent an hour up there Thursday night just watching the kids run around, talking to the kids. The kids love the place. They love the thing being in good, good condition. Uh, there's a lot of, uh, of labor and love that go into keeping that track in good condition, as is post-22, 320. Uh, the ASA softball fields. If you want to use the ASA softball fields, you got to schedule that ahead of time. You got to you got to pay money to help maintain the fields. And I'm just going to read the lease here that they signed with the city, and it says, uh, under use by others, leasee will not allow other organizations to use the premises under the lease without the express written consent of the public works director or his or her designee. Leasee shall allow other persons to use the premises if the premises are not in a bona fide 
use by the leasing in keeping with the best interest of the community and equitable access to all city recreation facilities. Leasing agrees to negotiate in good faith as to the use of the premises by others. The maintenance costs for such use shall be determined by leasee and authorized user, provided, however, that the public works director will determine said costs if the parties are unable to agree. So I think there is a good lease in place. There's a good program in place. If there's other people that want to use the park, they can approach those people. I, I went there Thursday and asked them if anybody had approached them outside to use the, the track, and they had said there was none. So I think in, in the best interest of the community and the people involved with BMX racing and is that we allow them to continue what, what is going now and what their leases says that they need to do and need to provide for. I think they're willing to, to work with people and, and come up with the solution that they had. So I would urge my colleagues to you know, take this into consideration and understand that they're not any different than any or the organization that puts in a lot of work into that track. I mean, and I've been there when people have been ridden it in the rain. There's people up there with radio controlled cars just ripping it apart with no, no interest in coming back and either helping pay for it or, or put their, their sweat equity into the place too. I don't think these people are unapproachable. I think they're very approachable. So if there is a need there that they could, as the lease says, come to the public works director and get an okay to, to use the, use the uh, facilities. They don't even have the right to allow other people to use the facility as this lease is written. So thank you. Thank you. Motion on the floor is for approval. Any further discussion? Any further discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. aye. Opposed? Motion passes with one no from Alderman Ron Kroger. Two no's. Two no's. And was that from Patty also? No, yeah. Okay. Let's take a roll call, please. Waker. Aye. Olson. Aye. Kroger. Krobeck. Aye. Adcock. LaCroix? Aye. Martinson? Aye. Weifenbach? Aye. Krepke? Aye. Chapman? Aye. Motion passes 9 to 1. <coughs> no, it was 9 to 1, correct, Jackie? That's correct. Thank you. Item number 9, please. And this would be under legal and finance. Uh, Kieran, can you please read that in? I'm, I'm sorry, 19, please. Recommend that the city attorney's office prepare a resolution adopting the technology use policy as the council's appropriate computer use policy. And that my motion would be to approve, but the question I had was, was this what we discussed at legal well, and finance? Let's, thank you. We have a motion and a second. Yeah, Alderman Olson, now you, you do have the floor, ma'am. Thank you. My concern was, was this the item that we talked about at legal and finance? And Jason is nodding his head yes. Okay, let's go to Jason Green, our city attorney. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. There were two computer use items that were discussed at legal and finance. One was the appropriate use policy. That's the item that's currently before the council, and I would point out that that resolution has already been prepared. It's in your folders. So if the council was inclined, you could approve that tonight. The other item, I believe, is item 49 on tonight's agenda, and that dealt with a recommendation on an email policy. That item will be coming up on the agenda yet tonight. Thank you. Okay, Alderman Olson, you still have the floor, ma'am. Thank you. Okay, very in good. That, in which case, then, I, my motion stands, and I will be in support of the motion on the floor. Okay. Just for clarification, the motion on the floor is recommending the city attorney's office prepare a resolution adopting the technology use policy as the council's appropriate computer use policy. Let's go to Alderman Sam Quaker. Thank you, Mayor. So the motion is to prepare or the motion is to adopt the one? The motion is to ask the city attorney's office to prepare. Okay. Uh, I'm, I'm assuming that what we have is probably the basis for this in our folders that's the basis for this item let's go to Jason Green our city attorney thank you mayor um, approximately a month and a half ago our office presented several options to the legal and finance committee those have been uh, linked to the agenda since then the recommendation from our office was to select the policy that is reflected on the resolution that's on the dais 
and that is the recommendation from the Legal and Finance Committee also. If the council would like more time to discuss that, you certainly could continue the item. Or just approve the motion on the floor. Very good. Alderman Quake, you still have the floor, sir. Thank you, Mayor. As I understand, the motion is simply to proceed with the preparation, but I do have one question. The last paragraph says, all city employees and members of the council, when, when that's being stated, does that include boards, commissions, and committees that may receive city-issued um, technology? And sure. if not, if that could be addressed. Okay, let's go to Jason Green, city attorney. Thank you. I believe the policy does address public officers so it would be applicable to those folks also. If you'd like it to be more explicit, we can certainly do that. Could you just check that between now and then? Because it doesn't appear to say that in the resolution. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Let's go to any further lights. The motion on the floor is for approval of the recommendation that or to recommend that the city attorney's office prepare a resolution adopting the technology use policy. Any further discussion on that? Seeing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion passes. We are on to item number 20, please. And Karen, if you could also read that in. Recommend that another public meeting be held regarding the downtown parking plan and that notices be sent to the property owners affected by <coughs> this plan, which essentially means everyone in the, within the parking um, plan just um, recommendations. Yeah, and I would, I would move approval of that. Second. We have a motion and a second. Just for clarification, Jason, do we also need to continue this item to a specific date or not? Uh, Mr. Mayor, I also have a comment once okay. the motion is on the floor. Okay. Yes, we have a second. Jason, do we need a date specific to continue? I would recommend that the, the council treat this as a continuation motion for a time specific. So there's a definite deadline to hold that public hearing and to have a report back to the council. 30 days seems like it would be appropriate. And um, as a part of the continuation motion, then the council would be asking for notifications to be sent to the property owners and th that public hearing to be held. I think that was your motion, wasn't it, Karen? Yes, except oh. I have one clarification. Okay, please go ahead. My understanding of the discussion that we had was that this be a special council meeting so that it involve um, all the council members. And therefore, there was some discussion about those who felt um, they had not received enough information about the parking plan and therefore I thought it was I personally thought the discussion was leading in the direction of a special council meeting which would then mean all the council members would be able to hear all of the testimony okay. and I certainly don't disagree with uh, the rest of the motion for 30 days makes a lot of makes okay. sense to me here and this is your motion so I would assume that that is part of your motion yep. so the motion is to continue this item uh, for 30 days and to uh, set up a special council meeting which in essence would uh, serve as the open house or public uh, hearing for this item. That okay. would be correct. Very good. Discussion on that motion, please. And just, uh, just um, so everyone is uh, clear about this, the motion is to basically a continuation motion. So let's please try to uh, uh, keep our comments to that motion. Uh, let's go to Marsha Elkins. Thank you, Mayor. The motion as it's presented references notification of the property owners. There was discussion at committee about also notifying the residents and I guess the staff would ask for clarification of that so we notify the appropriate parties. Okay, let's go back to the motion maker. My understanding of the discussion, this would be both residential and commercial property within the, any of the um, described streets um, of the downtown um, I think, parking plan. I think the question was asking, uh, was not only, wasn't distinguishing between commercial and residential, but between property owners and residents. In other words, we would mail to the folks listed as the owners and also mail to the res or to the ad physical address itself. I think. Yes, excuse me. Okay, very good. That was in that was intrinsic with the very good. With that motion. discussion, further discussion. Let's go to Alderman Sam Quaker. Thank you, Mayor. My my concern is this: is that we we are um, proceeding with a, a public hearing um, during almost the busiest time of year for the intended audience, meaning downtown. Uh, and adjacent to downtown business owners, I think we may be making a mistake by trying to force this within the next 30 days. Um, we have uh, the rally, we also have city budget and uh, a, a number of other events uh, coming up. Um, I, I would be, um, um, I think that would, it might be a better idea to uh, have this, um, uh, the final council meeting where we can actually vote uh, and have it a special meeting and have that sometime in September after Labor Day. 
so that no one can say that this, this um, you know, came through without adequate opportunity for, um, for public comment. Thank you. Thank you. Let's go to Alderwoman Deb Hadcock. Um, about the, the residents and the commercial marsh, I would think that would be any place that anybody was going to get metered and be affected by this parking plan. I think that would make sense, if that makes sense to you. Marsha. I guess staff would look at the, the parking plan in those areas that are impacted. We would identify as uh, within that boundary and notify both the address and the property owner of those different. Thank you, Marsha. I appreciate it. Um, I think staff for Monica and JJ um, and the mayor for doing all the work on this, if we have to delay it in order to get to the decision in the end that is a positive solution to this, I'm willing to do whatever needs to be done. If it's 30 days, that's fine. If it needs to be later, um, whatever it takes. Um, I don't think we're forcing it. We've been doing this for how many months now? But uh, long story short, if it, whatever the council decides on this, I am willing to go with that. So thank you. Okay, let's go to Alderman Malcolm Chapman. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Just a point of clarification. The 30 days, is that that the public hearing would take place within 30 days or we have within 30 days to set the meeting? Let me see if I can clarify. I, I think what this would be, this item would be continued to a council meeting basically 30 days from today and that prior to that a public hearing which would be a special council meeting would be held the alderman Chapman i'm going to make a substitute motion i think that's a little unrealistic that we're going to find all these residents and tenants and <coughs> property owners get notice out and then have all the people come here before meeting and then we're going to discuss this in 30 days i i tend to agree with sam that we need a little bit more time I would make a substitute motion that we, in effect, the, the same motion, but that we do this prior to September 30th, prior to the end of September. Second. Okay, we have a substitute motion and a second to continue the item to the second city council meeting in September. And that notification shall be given to both the physical address and to the, um, to the owners uh, of the property as identified in, in county records. And let me think, anything I'm missing there? I think that covers it. Okay, discussion on the substitute motion. No. Alderman Chapman, you still have the floor, sir. Yeah, my, my motion didn't say the second council meeting in September because that's September 15th, which is only halfway through the month of September. So that's why okay. I think Karen said something about a special council meeting. And I, and I still come back to be prior to the end of September, which is September 30th. Here, here's the only problem with that. I'm going to look to Jason. We need to be date specific on a continuation motion. Is that not correct? In, in cases of noticed public hearings, you've got to be very specific about the date. Mm -hmm. This is an item that, that doesn't require a public hearing by statute, so I think it would be appropriate if the council was inclined to say we're going to continue this to a special council meeting to be set sometime prior to September 30th. Gotcha. Very good. And <coughs> Alderman Chapman, that was the intent of your motion. Okay, very good. Discussion on that motion. And there again, we are going to talk only about the continuation to a special council meeting. With that, Alderman Bob Probutt. Thank you, Mayor. I, I think that uh, given the volume of communications we've had from uh, interested parties, this is important not to rush through. And I do support giving this adequate time so that everybody can get back from vacations, get through the tourist season, get through rally time, and be prepared to have a full discussion of this because I, I haven't seen this volume of communications from concerned people on any issue probably since the Walmart issue and so I think it's that important that we give it time to be aired out appropriately. Thank you. Thank you. Let's go to Alderman Bill Okrepke. Thank you very much Mr. Mayor. <clears throat> you know I'm looking at the people over here that are in that are in the uh, uh, or they're representing or part of the YMCA. Uh, how are these people going to get notified and, and make sure that they're here? I mean, there's other people that are users, uh, that are full-time users of the parking, people that work downtown, the, uh, the county people that are working, that, that work and, and work down there. They also have the people that are, well, the list could go on and on. Uh, how do we want to address that and how do we want to make sure that, you know, this happens? Because, I mean, these people here, unless they found out through somehow, they would not be notified because they're part of the YMCA. So how do we make sure that happens? Uh, <clears throat> I'm not sure putting it in the newspaper is going to work. Uh, 
I'm not sure putting it in through the other media outlets going to work either. Uh, I mean, there's we've been working on this thing for over a year now, and and we've been going out to everybody to come join us to be part of the shareholders and stakeholders uh, to make these decisions and come up with a good plan. So, I've <coughs> we just make you know, how do we want to go about doing this? And I'm certainly open up for for suggestions. Yeah. Was that a question or yes? Can, who was it directed to, please? Anybody that wants to talk about it. I mean, <laughs> I mean, if we, if we don't care, that's fine. If we're not interested in doing that, that's fine. But I'm just raising the question: How do we make sure that the people that you know that don't live there, that aren't owners of businesses, that aren't owners of buildings, and don't, and the people that don't live on the second floor, how do we make sure that we get those people involved, and how make sure that they get their chance to talk and, and visit? Okay. Let's go to Alderman Karen Olson. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. And I know that in regard to Mr. Okrepke's concern, um, having served as the YMCA board president for a period of time and serving on the board about nine years, um, no organization that I've ever belonged to has a more effective communication system than the YMCA. So I have no worries that the YMCA will not be aware of this issue. Um, as to the other folks that you're noticing, um, it will just be incumbent, I think, on media to contact those kind, those employees and those who are people who are perhaps in some fashion not officially noticed. But um, we can certainly recommend that property owners and um, people who are leasing spaces in the downtown um, keep their employees apprised because I think it's very important that, ever, that a full discussion of this take place. Thank you. Thank you. Let's go to Alderman Sam Quaker. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, I'd like to, in looking at the council um, uh, calendar, I'd like to suggest um, September 22 as the uh, the date. We have council meetings on September 2 and September 15, and I think the 22nd of September would be a uh, a good date um, for that um, for that meeting. So I don't know if that has the support of the motion maker, but I think if we can come up with a decision tonight, that will make the notification process a um, a lot easier. Why don't we do it this way? We'll treat that as a friendly amendment. We'll go to the motion maker and, and ask his uh, <coughs> concurrence. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I, um, I'm just looking at my calendar and we already have a meeting that evening, or some of us on the council, a strengthening families and improving outcomes for children meeting that evening. Um. Why, don't we, <laughs> why don't we do it this way? The motion on the floor is to set up a special council meeting prior to the end of September, correct? And it'll be up to council leadership uh, to actually establish that date. So with that, let's go to Alderman Lloyd LaCroix. Thank you, Mayor. I was just going to comment on that. We have <clears throat> another special meeting that we need to line up prior to September or during September. So I'd like to, I think the council leadership need to get together and figure out which ones we have and, and line them that way and give notice. We'll, we'll definitely do that. I also wanted to make a comment on, I, op I attended the open house on, on the parking plan and and seeing quite a few people come and go, but I think this is a good idea to give everybody notice to give them a, another chance for a meeting to come down and view what's going on. Thank you. Very good. Thank you, everyone. Motion on the floor is for approval. Any further discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. aye. Opposed, motion passes. We're on to item 23, please. Karen, could you please read that in? I'm sorry. Item 23, please. Thank you. Approving a request by Dream Design International Incorporated to consider an application for a revised project plan for tax increment district number 44 on property located northwest of the intersection of Catron Boulevard and 5th Street. And I would move approval. We have a motion second for approval. Any discussion on that motion? Let's go to Alderman Sam Quaker. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I did not uh, support the uh, creation of this TIF, but in reading the project plan, it's my understanding that um, the project plan amendment uh, is, in essence, a benefit for the uh, taxpayers since the schedule, instead of the majority of the street being completed in um, 2011, uh, much of it will be completed in 2009 with the remainder completed in 2012. So uh, if the applicant is here tonight, I'd like clarification on that. 
uh, and also uh, an estimated amount on, on what percentage or what amount will be, uh, will be saved and if my interpretation is, uh, is correct regarding the project plan amendment. Sam, could you just state your question? Uh, I assume that's for Mr. Shaffey. Mr. Shaffey? And could you just state your, qu your questions uh, one more time, please? Okay. Um, my, my question is, 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 is my reading of the project plan correct that, that this constitutes a benefit to the taxpayers in terms of the, uh, of, of the schedule? And what is the, um, the benefit in terms of uh, percentage or dollars saved? Mr. Shaffey. Hanny Shaffey with Dream Design. Good evening, Mr. Mayor and Council Members. Uh, I believe the question, uh, uh, Alderman uh, uh, Quaker, is uh, in regard to items 47 and 48. Is that your question in regard to Plum Creek and Zanstras? No. We're on this item 23. 23, actually, there, this one is actually just uh, allocation of some funds internally between the items of the TIF because the TIF was based on very raw estimated uh, costs and the final numbers are based on the actual construction cost. This is for Fifth Street Tax Increment District, which was created a long time ago, and these are just modifications internally within the TIF. Mr. Quaker, Thank so you. the floor. Anything else? Okay, motion on the floor is for approval. Any further discussion? Let's go to Alderman Ron Weifenbach. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. When this came through at Legal and Finance, I asked a question to see uh, my understanding that, that, uh, that this TIF, since it was uh, built out already, would, would start paying back and had a tax assessed value. And there was a uh, taxes that were being paid on it. And the question I had was, is uh, now that we know the level of taxes that's being paid back and uh, if it was appropriate to look at, for the city to look at bonding this, this TIF out, paying it off at a lower interest rate and saving, saving probably hundreds of thousands, if not millions of dollars on interest charges. So, and I was looking for an answer tonight. Did, did you want to direct that to? That'd be to, to our finance department. Okay, let's go to Jim Preston, our city finance officer. Thank you, Mayor. If I understand the question, the question is, is, is essentially what, what would be my opinion or do, you think, do I think it would be worthwhile to actually bond uh, to pay this off? And I guess, uh, well, my response to that would be no. I think there would be a number of disadvantages to that. First off, uh, the city would be t assuming the risk as opposed to the developer who now has the risk. Uh, that would increase our debt, which would go against our debt limit, which uh, would could affect our ability to borrow. We have some uh, fairly large projects coming up, water, et cetera, and I wouldn't want to do anything that would uh, maybe limit our ability to, to acquire funds to do those major projects. And uh, I think the liability against the city would probably not, in my opinion, not make that worthwhile. Is that the type of information you're looking for, Mr. Weifenbach? Mr. Weifenbach, you have the floor, sir. No, actually, I was just looking for facts, just numbers that were facts that showed uh, how much this is, how much is collecting on this TIF in the period of time it's going to take to pay it off. Now, if we bonded for it, what would the interest rate be? What would be the period of time? And would it be, would, could, it, could the city bond for something like this? I'm not concerned on whether I mean, if there's a risk involved, I think that risk has already been taken. The project's done. It, it was, it's got a cash flow, I'm assuming, but I don't know what it is because nobody can seem to answer that question. And I guess that's the one I'm asking for, is what is the current cash flow on this TIF in, in its current position right now today? Let's, let's try to, I'm gonna go out to Marsha. She's, go ahead, Marsha, give it a try. Growth Management Staff and Finance met this afternoon. The anticipated revenue for 2008 as identified by the um, county auditor, is $407,172.40. Uh, while the project improvements are built out, which is public infrastructure, the property itself is not built out. Um, just to give you a comparison, in 2008, we anticipated in the TIF project plan that we would receive $246,000. Uh, we're re uh, anticipating that we'll receive about twice that, uh, if the estimate from the auditor is correct. However, in the 2009 estimate included in the project plan was $497,000. Mm -hmm. 
So again, we don't feel that, that revenues are stabilized yet, particularly when we look at the fact that the property itself is not built out. A large portions of this uh, vacant commercial area have not yet developed. And I think that influenced the recommendation that you heard from the finance officer. We can give you more extensive numbers. We have a chart here of the revenues that have been received to date. But again, comparison of 2008 and 2009 numbers, uh, we're just ahead of where we would anticipate being. Uh, but we haven't yet stabilized because the properties have not been constructed on yet. Okay. Alderman White from back. Anything else? That was a lot of the, a lot of the answers. Is there a way that in the future we can make these available, so when these when these changes come ahead, that we have some actual facts that we can make good judgment calls, good decisions. We will do our best to address that in future uh, reallocation changes to existing tips. That's my understanding. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Anything else? I, I'd still like to see what. The ability is to bond in these in the future and not, i mean once they start cash flowing out it doesn't make sense to me financially that we we at least have that option on the table without throwing it out before we <coughs> really look at it so i just i'd like i guess ask that question to the finance officer if we can pursue that and see what what the reality of that is mr preston do you understand the question so you would like me to bring back information if we were going to, we would sell bonds to completely pay this project off what what that would cost yeah what what interest rate it would be how it would affect our uh, our standing in the bond markets if we go to future bond and some of the water projects things that we have coming down the pipeline and okay i had one more question for okay, please the developer okay. Ask your question, please. Is Hanny still here? Yep, he certainly is. Hanny, we had a conversation about this, Tiff, and you'd mentioned you're going back to the bank to uh, renegotiate the interest rate. Has that that taken place? Is there an option for that happening? Hanny? Yes, sir. We are actually in negotiations, and as soon as this is approved, this amendment is approved, we're going to have a meeting with the bank either Wednesday or Thursday. And the goal is there to reduce the interest rate from 9% to around the 6 to 6.5%. That's our hope is actually to be around the 6% right. if we can. That would be, that, that's one of the decisions I made in going ahead with proving this because we're moving a, a capital cost to a financing cost. So in understanding that we're going, you're looking to renegotiate that interest rate made a huge difference in, in, in my ability to vote yes for this tonight. So that's, thank you, Ann. Thank you. Okay. Let's go to Jason Green, our city attorney. And thank you, Mayor. Just a comment on the feasibility of bonding against tax increment district revenues. I think it's important for the council to remember that when the city issues bonds that are backed either by sales tax or by the revenues from utilities, those are very stable income sources and the bonding agencies look upon those very favorably. So there's very low risk. As a result, the interest rate we play is very low. Tax increment bonds are inherently more risky and as a result, the interest rate is gonna be significantly higher on those simply because of the revenue source that's being used to pay those off. Um, in the conversations that I've, that I've had with uh, Bond Council, they think that uh, for the most part, it's not favorable for municipalities to bond against TIF revenues unless that's the only alternative available. Thank you. Let's go to Alderman Lloyd LaCroix. Thank you, Mayor. I just had a question from Marcia. Go ahead. And <clears throat> Some of the numbers that you brought up, uh, you mentioned that the TIF districts are bringing in, those <clears throat> those are readily readily available down at the county auditor's office, aren't they? I mean, you can go in and ask for, or is that, Marsha? Certainly, it's available from the county auditor. That's where the city receives it. Um, uh, finance office has those that information as well. They indicate the receipts that we have, and they keep track of that. So that's where city staff obtained it was from, um, city finance. Oh. Okay, thank yep. you. Very good. Motion on the floor is for approval. Further discussion? Does anyone wish to speak uh, before Alderman Weifenbach speaks for a second time? Sorry about that, Ron. Thanks to you, Mr. Mayor. I just wanted to clarify myself on one thing to make Go. sure that, that our city attorney and our finance officer understand that I'm not talking about an upfront bonding. I'm talking about once this thing cash flows, once there's taxes assessed on it, and once we know that in this case, in this particular incident, we know today that we're going to collect $467,000 in, in, in $407,450 in taxes on it, and we know this in cash flows. I'm not looking at an upfront TIF. I'm looking at once the thing's in place, and it's been in place for years, two, three years, then we come back and say, 
is this favorable for us to I think that without verbiage makes a difference a huge difference on the risk that's assessed so thank you thank you for the discussion let's go to Alderman Bill O'Krepke thank you very much mr. mayor I'm certainly going to support this it just makes a lot of sense but I do have a <coughs> excuse me I do have a question from for uh, City Attorney Jason Green okay. uh, what would be the I mean you, you make a comment he, well the, he made a comment that that the bonds would be very very inexpensive uh, interest rate wise if it was backed by a sales tax or, or some other uh, funding such as that now we're talking about a tax increment financing uh, way of, re of returning that money or providing the, the, the revenue stream what would be and I know it's tough to ask you for a, a hard number but if if Hanny is going to be able to pull a six six and a half what would we be able to pull if we asked for the if we went through the bonding issues and go through that process what what could we expect as far as uh, as far as an interest rate on that bond let's go to Jason Greener <laughs> city attorney thank you mr. mayor I'm a little out of my realm here but I'm sure your finance officer wouldn't disagree with me when I tell you you never know what interest rate you're going to get until you actually sell the bonds but as a general proposition based on the conversations that I've had with bond councils if you're using TIF revenue as opposed to um, sales tax or utility rate revenue you're probably looking at least twice the rate okay mr. Okrepe so before anything else okay motion on the floor is for approval any further discussion seeing none all those in favor signify by saying aye, aye. opposed motion <laughs> passes item number 24 please Karen could you read that in yes item number 24 approve a request by Ferber engineering company incorporated for North Street fire station LLC LLC to consider an application for a creation of tax of a tax increment district on property located east of La Crosse and west of Dias Avenue and I would move approval we have a motion second for approval discussion on that motion let's go to Alderman Sam Quaker thank you mayor uh, in reading the uh, project plan or the district um, memo and also the uh, tax increment financing committee uh, minutes uh, from June um, it appears that um, based on the fact that the uh, the city attorney and the assistant city attorney in the meeting actually offered the motion to approve and voted for it uh, that um, tells me that it um, it does meet the definition of uh, of blight um, which um, in a sense is truly historic um, I I think but in all seriousness though I I the, the this district does include um, salvage yard properties on the north side of the interstate so so in it does meet the definition of blight so my questions are this if it includes the salvage yard properties does the project plan specifically include cleaning up um, those properties and then no. I have a couple follow-up questions let's go to Marsha Elkins the project plan directly does not involve cleaning cleaning up those uh, properties however one of the concerns that's uh, addressed is the remediation potentially on the property uh, that is anticipated to be acquired by the city gifted to the city if you will of any underground flows that might be coming off of those uh, areas with brownfield sites such as uh, these facilities you often see that there's uh, groundwater contamination or soil contamination so there is remediation money identified uh, in the project plan okay Alderman Quaker you still have the floor sir thank you and I hope that we will proceed also with the next logical step of of encouraging uh, amendments to the project plan to encourage even more uh, revitalization of that um, of that blighted area a couple of remaining questions one is is where exactly will the new fire station uh, be located and the land that is to be don donated to the city is that being donated in the free and clear or will the cost of that land be paid back through the TIF here we go Marsha Elkins the uh, approximately three acres that have been identified would be located along East North Street just to orient you on this slide the interstate is here at the very south mall drive and its extension that's currently being constructed is here and then East North Street is built to approximately <coughs> this location um, so as part of this the infrastructure that's involved in construction as part of this uh, is to get access to the fire station uh, that is a free and clear gift that's been uh, proposed by the FMLC group uh, to the city of Rapid City 
and it is not included for the reimbursement of the city for the value of the property or to the landowner. Alderman Quaker, you still have the floor. And then I have a, um, a, a question um, relating to the, the, app, the uh, who are the partners in the, in, the, in the LLC? Do you happen to have that? Marcia? There are some 27, 29 individuals that are uh, partners to that. I probably have it in the file uh, if you'd like me to try and pull that out okay. in FMLC. If you could, if you could just let, let me know later. I think when the, when the new amendments um, to the, with the TIF process come through in a few weeks, that will be uh, included in, in the upfront reports, if I remember right, but I, I guess. Marcia? The project plan is pending. That's the second item on this agenda. So uh, we would anticipate there'd be action on that potentially tonight. Okay. And then question for Chief Rolfing. Yes, go ahead. Um, Chief, my question to you is, is, is um, do you support this, lo the, does the fire department and you support this, uh, this location um, for this new fire station? And do you believe that this is the, uh, the best available location in terms of uh, response times and benefit to the community chief right. yeah uh, yes yeah and I would say yes we do support it and I've talked before there's there's lots of things that we look at when we're locating fire stations obviously the cost of the ground major thoroughfares and oh you know our, our, our GIS response times and with mall drive East North Street and, and actually us being able to get up to Seeger it, it, it's a uh, you know, it's a very good site. Is it the perfect site in a perfect world? It might not be, but taking everything into consideration, I think it's a very good site that will be able to cover pretty much most of the uh, uh, growth in the north and east part of the city. Okay, Sam, anything else? And then you would recommend uh, closure of the station at the corner of Anamosa and Maple. Chief? Yes, yes. As soon as that could be constructed, uh, that is correct. We would shut that station down. Thank you. Okay. Anything else? Let's go to Alderman Lloyd LaCroix. Thank you, Mayor. I just wanted to say another man's junk's another man's treasure as far as blight just goes. I mean, if you, if you go out in that area, there, uh, no, I'm serious. There, there's a, actually an auto museum in one of the salvage yards and, and some art made out of a horse, out of, out of bumpers made into a horse. I mean, the guys took a lot of time to do, to make a museum, charges five bucks to go in and go through. Not all the salvage yards are that way, but I mean, there is one that it's, that's fairly decent up cut. Thank you. <laughs> okay, let's go to Alderman Ron Weifenbach. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I, I asked some questions, like probably very extensive questions on, on this TIF. I'd be in having allowed a week to decide on something that's, you know, this, is a, this is a big deal and there's a lot that goes into this. Um, I'd, I'd have questions on, you know, some of the um, areas of, of oversizing costs, public costs, public service costs, if they could be broken out. It's just very general. Uh, the question that Alderman Quaker brought up that he continually brings up that we always have to continually ask a question of who's involved in this partnership in the LLC. Uh, it may not seem important or trivial, but it is important. And, uh, and there's requirements in the application requirements specifically state for uh, uh, audited financial statements from the business. Have you had financial, uh, audited financial statements in the application process, you would be able to know, number one, who is all involved in this. I'd, I'd like to see some of the same information that was required on the application requirements. There's, uh, uh, I'd like to see a breakdown on the costs that are oversizing costs that are paid by the TIF. I'd like to see what developer costs are being paid. Um, I, some, I mean, there's a lot of items on the agenda. We have a week to, to, to swallow a lot of these things. I'd like some opportunity for some more time to, to research this uh, in, a, in a perfect world, to quote the chief, I would like to see an impact study on how uh, this would affect that area and the infrastructure that is provided this area that, that means that there won't be any taxes generated from it for a period of up to 12 years and how the fire station will substantiate that. I'd like to see an impact study on how that would affect uh, property taxes in, in, this, in and around the city of Rapid City. Um, I would also like to see some other things that are on a copy of the proposed wage scale for employee benefits packages and a full part, full and part-time employment levels that would be reached 
in this area when this, this thing was built out. Just some of the simple things that are on the application that are supposed to come forward. I, I don't see that they're attached anywhere. Um, I think it helps in making these big decisions to have an analyzation of all those types of things. Uh, I understand if, that this meets the blight requirement. We're not really cleaning up the junkyards, as was mentioned earlier. We're remediating some of the, the runoff from the junkyard areas. Well, I'm not sure that I quite understand why that is. And I'd like some more time to swallow this and analyze it. And then I don't know if it's going to require bringing a third party in to analyze some of this stuff for us, to analyze these numbers and analyze how this affects everything around it and how it affects everything going forward. So I, I would like to, and I don't know if I'll get support, but I'll give it a shot. I'd like to make a, a motion, a substitute motion to continue this item to give the council opportune time to actually make an educated decision on this tip. Thank we have, you. We have a substitute motion to continue for two weeks, Ron, or we need a date specific? I'd say probably, you know, two weeks is going to put a lot of pressure on us with, with the rally coming up in, in busy summers. I'd say for um, four weeks, uh, okay. in the second council meeting. In August. Thank you. Okay. We have a substitute motion. Do we have a second? Okay, we have a second. Discussion on that motion, and just a reminder, we will be discussing only the continuation motion, please. Let's go to Alderwoman Deb Hadcock. If we want to continue, that, that's fine, but based on the TIF guidelines that we have now, they have followed the rules, if I'm correct, uh, Marcia, at this point. Um, we have not changed the guidelines to the TIF, and we do have a meeting July 24th at 7 o'clock um, to discuss with the public on the new guidelines of the TIF, but at this point, Marsha, we do not have any of those guidelines changed, have we? Marsha? The guidelines have not changed, um, but some of the items that uh, Mr. Wiefenbach uh, addresses uh, are required as part of our existing policy. And Mayor, if you would give me just a, a little broad power here to, to address the unusual nature of this TIF that be allowed. Why, why don't you go and take a few minutes and see if you can explain this. Thank you. Um, this is unique in that it really is to benefit the city of Rapid City. We have two individuals, two parties that have uh, proposed coming forward. They are proposing to form the North Street Fire Station LLC. They've actually incorporated and I have articles of the organization and domestic limited liability company information in the file. Um, they actually involve the McKee family who are in the process of uh, acquiring the property at this location and folks involved with, uh, I think it's called KR Toyland, but it's the uh, existing Toyota dealership here in town. They're in the process of acquiring this property and they would do that whether or not we form a tax increment financing district or not. The unusual aspect of this is that they have been willing through our negotiations and with the request from staff and the mayor to upfront and in essence be the banker for the city of Rapid City to get the infrastructure in place to address the fire station site. So it is a unique opportunity for us to work with them. There are developer costs included in this uh, project. Potentially the uh, portion of the uh, widening of East Mall Drive, if you'll remember, we have an agreement with the property owner to the east. Uh, they will be paying 58%. As we've talked about uh, in the past, some portion of the balance of it probably uh, would be identified in the traffic impact studies for these two properties uh, to participate in that cost. Uh, similarly, they would improve the box culvert here and extend the utilities and the roadway to the north. Involves the sanitary sewer lift station. They do not require that to be constructed for their project, but it is necessary for us to have a fire station. There's also improvements in terms of a drainage channel through this area and gravity sewer off to the east. So this is a unique uh, opportunity that we have. Uh, those property owners have again been willing to come forward and we appreciate their willingness to work with us to try to form a public-private partnership in this situation. Again, uh, we certainly could look at those other pieces of information, but in many cases they will be, not be appropriate for us to do so. The wage scale, again, this is not benefiting them. It is benefiting the city of Rapid City in terms of us being able to have a site available for us to build the fire station on. And I do want to make sure that uh, it's clear, as I indicated, there is no reimbursement for the land that's being uh, gifted to the city under this proposal. However, the city will be reimbursed its own cost that we have in our CIP plan for the cost of construction of that uh, fire station. So this is a unique situation. I'm not sure that the information that would typically be uh, required for a TIF is applicable in this case because of the unique nature. Okay, let's, uh, Alderman Deb Hadcock, you still have the floor, ma'am. 
Thank you, Marcia, for that explanation. I think a lot of the answers that we're looking for here have been just answered. I know there's always <coughs> answers that we can add to, but I, I would urge my colleagues to get a, with uh, Marcia on some of this stuff and Karen Bowman because they are answering the questions. They don't have all of them with them right now, but I think if you read the information that she has given and she does have and can give you, um, she can give you that explanation. Um, I think this is a good uh, tax increment district and I urge my colleagues to approve this tonight. Thank you. Let's go to, I'm going to go to Alderman Lloyd LaCroix uh, before we go to Alderman Juan, Ron Weifenbach for a second time. So let's go to Alderman Lloyd LaCroix. Thank you, Mayor. In light of what Marcia just explained, I, I don't support the present motion on the floor, but the original motion I'd be in favor of. Thank you. Thank you. Let's go to Ron Weifenbach. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I, I appreciate your explanation, Marcia. Uh, it's, it's still a big pill to swallow in one evening to, to I, I'm, I mean, I'm, I get caught in the middle of, of saying, you know, I'm sure it is a good thing. I looking at it on the onset, I'm tasked to give my up or down yay or nay on this. And I think if I'm a business owner or a, or a business maker, decision maker, I'm going to look at all the facts inside out. Have I had the opportunity to, to get a hold of Marsha? Absolutely not. I haven't had time. I, I, there's a lot of things on the agenda. I try to, to get a hold, get my arms around every one of them as possible, as much as possible, but I'm tasked to make an educated decision. I, I can't believe that there's enough information here for anyone to make a, to make a very good decision unless they spent hours analyzing this. And I guess I'm, I'm looking for possibly in the future maybe the TIF guideline committee that there is someone dedicated at some point to give an analyzation of, of the ins and outs of all these and how they affect the taxpayers of Rapid City, how they affect uh, Rapid City in general, how do they affect the, the economy. And, and Marsh had mentioned tonight that this doesn't fit typical, typical guidelines. I asked the questions and I'm, I'm still asking the same questions. A lot of them that Marsha did explain in the last several minutes, but there's still a lot of questions that are unanswered. They don't seem to be, we have a set of guidelines that aren't being met. They're not even they're not even being close to being met. And for whatever particular reasons they are, they may be good reasons. Uh, I just want some time, some extra time, to process it so I can make a good decision to protect not only the city and the taxpayers, but also to protect the developers and future developers that want to use these same tool for economic development. So, I appreciate the explanation, Marsha. Why I find it's a, it's a good explanation. I still find it. Uh, not enough for me to make a good decision that, that says this is, that can rest good tonight and say I made a good decision. Thank you. Okay, and let's go. We have a light on from Alderman Malcolm Chapman. Just a reminder to everyone, the motion on the floor is the substitute motion to continue. Let's go to Alderman Malcolm Chapman. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I don't support the motion to continue. Um, I, I think we've had time to look at this issue, but maybe in conjunction with our policy TIF review um, public meeting, one of the suggestions that could come out of that is that there's some added time delay in terms of getting uh, a TIF from the TIF committee to the actual council. So if that takes place in uh, going through the planning commission and then coming to the council, maybe we delay it another two weeks so that council members can have just a little bit more time to have that discussion with growth management and with Karen Bowman. I, I think if you seek that information out, I, I think it's available. Um, but I think some of those discussions are probably pretty difficult to have up here and try to get through all that information. But prior to this, I, I mean, I, I think the information is there. I think you'll find it um, helpful. But, you know, maybe that's one of the things that we do is to delay the process just a couple of weeks so um, council members can have just a little bit more time to digest that information. Um, back to the continuation motion. Um, I, I don't support the continuation motion. Thank you. Motion on the floor is a continuation substitute motion, which is a continuation motion. Let's go to Alderman Karen Olson. I will not be in favor in support of the motion on the floor to continue either. Okay, very good. Any further questions or any further comments? I'm seeing no further lights. The motion on the floor is a continuation motion. All those in favor of the continuation motion, say aye. aye. Opposed? No. Let's take a roll call, please. Olson. Bogus. <laughs> Robet? No. Adcock? No. LaCroix? No. Martinson? No. Weifenbach? Aye. Krepke? No. 
Chapman? No. Quaker? No. Motion fails, a 9 to 1 vote. We're back to the original motion. Back to the original motion. Further discussion. That motion is for approval. Further discussion. Sir. Yep. I'm just going back. Okay. Uh, let's go to Alderman Sam Quaker. Thank you, Mayor. I have uh, asked this of uh, every TIF uh, that has come forward, and that is, is that the uh, the property owners um, uh, be identified, and we can either do it now or we can do it at the next the next item. The next item is fine, but I I am gonna going to ask that that information be uh, read into the record. Thank you. Okay. Motion on the floor is for approval. Further discussion? Let's go to Alderman Malcolm Chapman. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Just quickly, I, I mean, just looked somewhere, and I can't remember if I was looking here or in the project plan, but the owners are identified. Oh. It's a there list of owners. Yeah, it's, right it's attached to the. Okay. Yep. Motion, anything else, Alderman Chapman? Motion on the floor is for approval. Any further discussion? Seeing no further lights, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion passes. Item number 25, please. Karen, could you please read that? Item in? number 25, a re approval request by Ferber Engineering Company Incorporated for North Street Fire Station LLC to consider an application for a project plan on property <coughs> generally described as being located north of U.S. Interstate 90, east of La Crosse Street, and west of Dias Avenue. And my motion would be for approval. Second. We have a motion, second for approval. Any discussion on that motion? Let's go to Alderman Sam Quaker. Thank you, Mayor. I would ask that the the property owners be uh, entered into the um, into the minutes. Um, is that a, a reasonable request, or you'd need to make that in the form of a motion? Well, we can, I could just ask that they be read. Then then it's going to be in the minutes, right? Marcia, do you have those available? Marcia. Yes, there are 12 different property owners within the district. Not all of them are active participants. One is DDB LLC. Two, Nine Leans Partnership. Three, Wisdom Inc. Four, Daniel Muchakolnas. My apologies. Five is LNB Enterprises LLC. Six is JD Muth Investments. Seven is Vernon Ruth Henriksen. Eight is FMLC Inc. Nine is Donald and Marcia Gorman, uh, DBA. A and A Auto Salvage. Ten is Kelly and Clifford Foster. Eleven is Clifford Foster doing business as Foster Enterprises slash Kelly Olson. And twelve is Gordon and Darlene Angel. And my apologies to Mr. Daniel. Something. <laughs> now that is that's a list of all the property owners within the TID district. Is that correct? That is all the property owners within the district. Yes. Okay. Very good. Alderman Quaker, sir, you saw the floor. Thank you, Mayor. There were several. Um, this is a little bit unusual because it's a. Um, in, there's an LLC, there's an LLC making the application, but then there's an LLC also within the group. So, uh, as I, I think it's um, okay to ask that who DDB. Um, I think I think we know number two, but who's LNB? And the other LLCs. I mean, can we have that printed in the minutes? And I guess if we can't get that information tonight, I guess that's one thing. But I, I think that that information should be um, provided um, you know, for future okay. for future hearings. Hersha, I, I guess my question would be: Is what's in front of us is a list of the property owners, not the applicants? And to try and get the uh, the owners or the stockholders and LLCs that are not part of the application may be somewhat difficult. You see where I'm going with that, Alderman Quaker? If I could. Please, go ahead. And, and the, re the reason that this question is asked, and, and it's not to cast suspicion on anyone, but this was the, these issues were brought up in the review committee to ensure that ensure the, the, the public that there is, an, is appropriate arm, arm's length distance between the financing institutions and the applicants. So, I'm going to be very upfront why I'm asking the, the question. Um, I'm not suspicioning anything at all. I just, uh, I just want the public record to reflect um, that, that this is um, fair and in, in, in the clear. And so I just wanted uh, assurance that, that there was that arm's length um, transaction between the financing institutions uh, and, the, uh, and the applicants. And that's why I had asked for the, the partners to be revealed. 
Let's go to Marsha Elkins. And perhaps um, there are representatives from the North Fire Station LLC, which is actually the party that would be, uh, us, we would be entering into some kind of developer's agreement with. There are representatives here tonight, and perhaps they could address who the parties are in that LLC, which I think are the ones that you're trying to uh, identify. Again, these other folks are just individual landowners who pro whose property, in some cases, only lies within the proposed district boundaries. Okay. Mr. Nooney. If you could identify yourself for the record and just give us an idea of who. I will, Mr. Mayor. My name is John Nooney, and I'm going to identify for you who the applicants are related to the pending uh, tax increment district. There are two LLCs. One LLC is known as MRS Land, Roman numeral two. That is made up of the three principals of the McKee auto dealerships, Ross McKee, Mark McKee, and Steve Kalkman. The second LLC is KR Toyland, who is represented by Mr. Huffman, and Mr. Huffman has asked that I just share this information with you. The principal on that is Kevin Randall, and the third member that is a part of the application process in the TIF is Mr. Chuck Lean that's sitting in the back row with us tonight. So there's two LLCs and Mr. Lean personally. So those are the applicants that are behind North Street Fire Station. Not to answer any other questions you may have. Okay, Alderman Quaker, anything else? Uh, thank you, Mr. Nooney. Uh, a question for you. Do, do, are you aware of you know the the other property owners that are being included in the TIF? Are you aware of any concerns that have been, or first of all, were they notified? And secondly, do you, are you aware of any concerns that were raised regarding their property being included in the TIF boundaries? I would have to defer that Mr. to Ms. Marsha Elkins. I know no one has contacted us and raised any concerns about it, Alderman Quaker, but that's all I can speak to about that. Okay. Marsha, can you address that? No notification of the property owners has occurred. It's not required under current policy. That is one of the proposals that will be coming forward under the revised TIF guidelines. Okay, very good. Anything else? Alderman Quaker. Thank you, Mayor. The, the the concern that I have is is the is the not, is the notification. I realize that the rules that this is under is the old process, but after the city had approved um, the downtown TIF um, last year, there were concerns raised by other people in the boundaries about not being notified, and I am I am concerned that if we pass this tonight, um, that we're going to have some speaker request forms in a few weeks saying. You know, I had a I had a TIF that was was in the um, in the hopper where I was planning to bring another TIF forward. I didn't realize that this TIF was coming through. You don't allow overlapping TIFs. Um, I wish I'd been notified that my property had been included uh, in a TIF. And um, there was no public notice per se individually for this particular um, TIF uh, application. That is my concern. I think. You know, I, I don't think that um, we've, are, we've created the district tonight so the, the accrual can, um, can, can start, the increment can be, actually we've already created the district. I just kind of debated myself and lost. So um, <laughs> any, anyway, um, I, I guess uh, uh, I am concerned that, that uh, the uh, property owners included uh, we're not notified. Hopefully, it won't be an issue, uh, but that is an issue that is being addressed by the committee. And the next set, of, the next TIFs that come forward will uh, hopefully uh, have uh, notifications to affected landowners. Thank you. Thank you. It's a bummer to lose to yourself, isn't it? Let's go to, <laughs> let's go to Alderman Malcolm Chapman. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I, I think it's a little problem when we start debating items that aren't policies or rules of the council. Um, one of the big issues that I've fought for and advocated for over the last year and a half in particular, and I will continue to do, is affordable housing, which is a component of TIF. And I try to form, prior to the, the, the things coming forward, I've tried to form a committee of interested people from all walks around the community so that we could start that discussion, and that was shut down. And rightfully so, because the TIF guidelines and the review committee has not delivered its work to the council yet. I bring this up because I would have been wrong, and that committee would have been wrong to meet 
and then start having discussion about how to improve TIF as it relates to affordable housing. The point that I'm making is that we should play by the rules that are in place. Now we've had this company or this, these nine owners or how many ever owners um, come forward. We've had LLCs now say who's part of it, and I'm all for transparency, but we're playing by rules that have not been adopted by the council yet, and I don't think that's fair. Um, I would hope that in the future that the mayor would stop that kind of conversation because we're not playing by that rules. I could say that I think that as good as this TIF is, I, th I think it's a, it's a wonderful thing for our community. We get that 42% of the road through, we uh, fire station and all of those sorts of improvements. But what I really would like to see happen out there is somewhere out there is some affordable housing. Now, that doesn't make any sense whatsoever, but those are the future rules that hopefully we play by. I think I've made my point. <laughs> Very good. <laughs> Let's go to Alderman Ron Weifenbach. The motion on the floor is for approval. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. And I'm, I'm not going to be labor the fact, but I think that um, in the words of Ma um, Alderman Quaker, I think that you kind of debated yourself there, Alderman Chapman, and, when, and you asked about the process and, and playing by the rules here. And it was one of the things I talked about earlier and I've alluded to is that uh, the rules, like Marsh had mentioned earlier, in, in, this, in this particular TIF are not clearly abided by. And that's the issue I have with the TIF. I have no, no issues other than that. You'd also mentioned the fact that um, in the process, we can't, we're, not, we're not available to, to make uh, our points made until it be, until it, until it's through the process. And that's, I've, I've, I've been challenged to be on this, on this uh, council to, to abide by the processes and protect the process, and that's, that's what I'm trying to do. But in, in within make it a good business decision, any business person, any business person that doing this TIF would, would go to the city and, and believe that they were going by the guidelines. I don't think we're shortchanging anybody there. I think that in some particular instance, in this particular TIF in amongst itself has not met the guidelines. There's, there is appropriate, as Marsha had mentioned and reiterated what I had, I had mentioned is that there is a request to have five years of audited financial statements from the applicants. I don't know that anybody on this council has seen them. That's part of the rules. Um, that was a simple request, and I don't think it's been a, it's been a request that's made, been all by, made by Alderman Quaker on several occasions, and it hasn't been abided by it. And these processes, understanding the process has to be protected on both sides. It has to be protected by the developer. It has to be protected by the taxpayers or App City. Is there guidelines that we're supposed to follow? Yes. And I think I, everything I had mentioned, everything I had asked for was, it was in, in request to the specific guidelines that we have in place now. Nothing out of the ordinary, nothing from left field, nothing that doesn't exist in the current guidelines. Do I think this is a good TIF as explained by our staff, by Marsha? Yes, absolutely. Do I think there's some analyzation that is lacking here? Absolutely, yes. And I, I believe that allowing, and as you alluded to earlier, Alderman Chapman is allowing for a two week period of time for us to either have a third party review with an impact study or allowing the council to review to our best of our layperson knowledge would be appropriate. So that being said, I just wanted to make sure I was clarified in the fact that I wasn't asking for anything that was outside the guidelines. It's in the current guidelines now, uh, but I haven't seen a TIF here come forward yet, maybe one or two that have met that particular requirement for the audited financial statements and laying out the costs and, and those things. So thank you. Okay. We're going to go to Bob Hurlbut, and I'm going to give Alderman Hurlbut some latitude because I've given everybody else some latitude. There are no additional lights after Bob Hurlbut. After Alderman Hurlbut speaks, we will be speaking only to the motion on the floor. I will not be given any additional latitude. With that, Alderman Hurlbut, please. Thank you, Mayor, and I, I appreciate the additional latitude. I probably won't use it. I just want to say uh, very briefly that uh, first of all, I, I, I do support the TIF uh, and the project plan before us. Uh, however, I, I just have to say that whether we have a policy in effect or not, I think it is clear that complete and thorough information for the decisions we make as a council is appropriate and not out of line to request whether there's a guideline in place or not. I think transparency and disclosure and complete information are what we are charged with having in front of us. In this case, I'm confident that, that we've got a good uh, tax increment district and project plan in front of us, and I'm comfortable with it. But I think the suggestion that we shouldn't ask for complete information is, uh, 
is tenuous. I think it's important to have that information, and those are my comments. Thank you, Mayor. Okay. Further discussion. The motion on the floor is for approval, and that's the only thing we're going to talk about. With that, Alderman Deb Hadcock. I believe the motion on the floor is the right motion. I also am listening to people, and sometimes when you're up here, I think you can get the complete information from the staff. Um, you have to do your homework. You have to ask them the questions that you're asking and not do your homework on the dais. Some people I see are doing their homework on the dais, so these guys don't have all the complete information, not because it's not transparent, because they don't know all the questions you're going to ask. Some of it's not on the TIF policy committee. Um, that hasn't changed yet on the new policy guidelines. We're asking stuff on the new guidelines, so Chapman was right on the process. Based on that, again, I think some of you guys are doing your homework on the dais and not asking the staff the right questions or the questions before they get up here. So let's be fair here, guys. I don't think it's not that you're not getting the questions or answered. It's you're putting them on the spot to answer them now. So be fair to them and be fair to this, uh, the people up here that have done their homework. Um, that's all of my comments. Thank you. Very good. Any further discussion? The motion on the floor is for approval. Seeing no further lights. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. aye. Opposed? No. Motion passes with one no from Alderman Weifenbach. Is that correct? Yes. Okay, very good. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. We're on to item 35A. And let's see, that is a travel request. Yep. Karen, do you have that? If not, I can read it in. Why don't you read it in? I'll, 35A, this is a travel request for the National League of Cities and is for a dollar amount of $2,500. The reason we're bringing this back is Patty Martinson, our new uh, council member, would also like to attend. We have a motion and a second for approval. And this is a travel request uh, to the National League of Cities. It'll be Malcolm Chapman, Bill Okrepke, and Patty Martinson for a total of $2,500. Any further discussion? Any further discussion? Motion on the floor is for approval. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. aye. Opposed? Motion passes. Thank you, everyone. That takes us to the end of the consent calendar, and we are on to the non-consent calendar items. Item 38 through 56, and the chair would look for a motion to open the public comment period. We have a motion and a second. Any discussion on that? Seeing none, all those in favor, signify by saying aye. Opposed? Motion passes. We are in the public comment period. Do we have any speaker request forms? We have no speaker request forms on items 38 through 56. Chair would look for a motion to close the public comment period. We have a motion and a second to close. Any discussion on that motion? Seeing none. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. aye. Opposed? Motion passes. We're on to item number 38 in ordinances. Karen, could you read number yes. 38 Item in, number 38, first reading of ordinance number 5409, adding the definition of vertical axis wind turbines by amending section 17.04.0, uh, excuse me, point seven four three of the Rapid City Municipal Code. My motion would be for approval. We have a motion and a second for approval. Any discussion on that motion? Any discussion? Seeing none. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion passes. Item number 39, Item number 39, first reading of ordinance number 5410, revising the sidewalk requirements by amending section 12.6.080 of the Rapid City Municipal Code. My motion would be for approval. Second. We have a motion and second for approval. Any discussion on that motion? Any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor, signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion passes. Item 40, please. First reading ordinance number 5411, adding vertical axis wind turbines as conditional uses in the medium density residential zoning district by amending chapter 17.12.030 of the Rapid City Municipal Code. My motion is for approval. Second. We have a motion and second for approval. Any discussion on that motion? Any discussion? Let's go to Alderwoman Deb Hadcock. Hey, Marsha, I asked you on the DNL was 65 due um, based on HUD regulations. Is that just for one? of the wind turbines on that or is there I think they can put up to seven can't they Marcia that would be the noise that would be measured at the property boundary so it could be a combination if more than one were approved for a single site so, so it would be a cumulative uh, at 65 noise. 65 okay. DNL at the property line thank you okay. further discussion motion on the floor is for approval any further discussion seeing none all those in favor signify by saying aye aye, aye. opposed motion passes Item number 41, please. First reading ordinance number, fi number 5412, adding vertical axis wind turbines as an accessory use by amending section 17.50.217 of the Rapid City Municipal Code. My motion is for approval. Second. We have a motion, second for approval. Any discussion on that motion? 
Any discussion? Seeing none. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion passes. Item 42, please. First reading ordinance number 5412, an ordinance amending section 17.07 of chapter 17 of the Rapid City Municipal Code, rezoning the within described property as requested by Donnie Krishman for Dream Deck Holdings LLC for a rezoning from Park Forest District to medium density residential district on property in the original town of Rapid City located at 815 First Street. My motion is for approval. We have, do we have a second? Okay. Number 42, that was for approval. Uh, we have a motion and second for approval. Discussion, I'm gonna go to Marsha Elkins here. She's flagging me down. Marsha. Thank you. Items 42 and 43 are both on the agenda for denial without prejudice. Um, again, that's uh, because of some changes that happened. So 42 would ask that you deny without prejudice. Okay, the chair would look for a substitute motion. We have a substitute motion and a second to deny without prejudice. Discussion on that motion. Alderman Quaker, do you have a very good. Alderman Sam Quaker. Thank you, Mayor Marcia. Could you um, help me out as to where this is located? I'm trying to picture it. Item 42 is located kind of at the uh, end of First Street, uh, up against the uh, hill uh, for uh, uh, Sky Starlight Village. Can you pull a aerial for you? Near Bellevue Drive. Do we even have any? I know the motion is for a denial. It's on his first reading, so I don't have slides. That's it would fine. be located on the north side of the hill rather than on the south side, right at the end of, of First Street. Okay. Where it abuts up into the hillside. Okay. Alderman Quaker, anything else? No, sir. Okay, very good. Motion on the floor is to deny with. Was, was it straight denial? Was deny at the applicant's request? No, without, without prejudice. prejudice. Without prejudice at the applicant's request. Everyone mm -hmm. clear on the motion. Motion is deny without, uh, see, with uh, prejudice at the applicant's request. Not at the applicant's request. Not at the applicant's request. Okay, drop that. <laughs> <laughs> okay, without prejudice. Everyone clear on the motion. <laughs> All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, the motion passes. Item 43, please. <coughs> First reading ordinance number 5414, an ordinance amending section 17.07 of chapter 17 of the Rapid City Municipal Code, rezoning the within described property as requested by Dream Design International Incorporated for a rezoning from no use district to medium density residential district on property generally described as south of Port Rush Road and west of Dunsmore Road. My motion is to deny without prejudice. Second. We have a motion and second to deny without prejudice. Any discussion on that motion? Any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed, motion passes. Item 44, please. Second reading ordinance number 5369, authorizing the police department to collect fees for the performance of criminal background investigations on city employment applications and city license applications by adding section 2.20.030 to the Rapid City Municipal Code with the recommended changes. My motion is for approval. Second. We have a motion and second for approval. Discussion on that motion. Let's go to Alderman Bob Robot. Thank you, Mayor. Mm -hmm. I'd like to first ask uh, for a description of just what the effect of this uh, change in the ordinance is and then to, to be able to comment briefly. Okay. And you want to ask that of Jason Green? Y yes, or Joel. Or Joel. Okay. Let's go to Joel. Joel Landine. Thank you, Mayor. Could you repeat the question, please? So, yeah, simply, uh, what is the, uh, the effect of the change in ordinance here? I believe this allows, and I don't want to misspeak, I think doubling of licensing fees in some cases or in all cases. I, I guess I just want to know what is the net change here? I assume you're talking about item number 44? Yes. Yes, sir. Um, I don't know at this point that there was a fee, but I would probably defer to uh, Chief Allender, I think he would probably have a better idea on what the fees were and discussed um, with our office what to include or collect for fees. Yes. Let's go to Chief. Go ahead, please. Thank you, Mayor. There are existing fees for all of these licenses. Um, security licenses, for example, a new license today costs $50 for the application and for annual renewals, $25. The additions, the additional costs 
which I've explained before, have to do with us collecting what we're going to have to pay out of pocket. Uh, we'll make those security license fees a total of uh, $85 for the first year and $60 for subsequent years for renewals. That's just one category. Uh, there's other business licenses and so on covered under this. Okay. Alden Robot, you stole the floor, sir. Thank you. And to my colleagues on the council, I think we've already um, addressed this issue once, and I, I don't, won't belabor the point, but to me it seems we could achieve cost savings by recovering our costs for the initial <coughs> application, um, but delaying the renewal by an additional year, thus cutting in half the number of renewals that have to be uh, processed in a given year. Uh, my inclination is to think that if there is an arrest or an incident involving a uh, security license in particular, that that individual will be held to task for that as part of compliance with the license and that to the extent this is deemed to be a public safety concern, I think we're still able to monitor licensees effectively and I think this may uh, free up time and, and resources for, for other uh, purposes uh, while still allowing for the full complete background checks along with full recouping of costs to the city. I just, I, I leave that to my colleagues. I think that we could extend the periods of these licenses and achieve both security, safety, and cost savings and resource savings. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to go to Jason Green because we had a conversation. I'm not sure this is the appropriate ordinance that this will address it. Let's go to Jason Green real quick. Uh, before we go to the rest of the council. Thank Jason. you, Mayor. This, this ordinance really is not the appropriate time to address the length of the license. What will follow the approval of this ordinance will be amendments to the provisions of the specific licenses that require background checks. And if the council wants to explore extending the terms, that, though, that would be the ordinance to take that particular uh, aspect of the, this question up at. Okay, very good. Let's go to Alderman Sam Quaker. Mayor, if I can just. Um, I'll tell you what, let's go and do this. So let's go to back to Alderman Hurlbutt and then we'll come back to Alderman Quaker. Go and ahead, please. My simple question is of uh, City Attorney Jason Green. Is that other ordinance you referred to coming forward? Jason? Assuming that this ordinance is approved tonight, I would anticipate that the other ordinance would be on the next legal and finance agenda. Thank you. Okay. Now let's go back to Alderman Sam Quaker. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, I very much appreciate um, the, the fact that we'll likely soon be having a discussion on, on increasing the uh, terms of the, of the licenses. I've done some research uh, into this, and um, the city of Sioux Falls, uh, for example, does not, maybe they should, but does not um, require licensing of, of security, uh, security personnel for, um, for bars. Um, I think that there is a, a good public safety component uh, to doing that. Uh, however, I, th I think that um, a longer term could at least be explored. And if it didn't work for security personnel, it certainly could be uh, explored for, um, uh, for uh, taxi drivers and, and alcohol uh, beverage licenses. Uh, we got some information and it's important that this be read in the record so that we all understand how large of an impact this will have in terms of, of doubling the um, or perhaps not doubling, but such a dramatic increase in the fees for, um, for individuals, um, for license holders. There are 273 beverage licenses in the city, 377 security licenses, 16 secondhand shop, uh, seven pawn shops, five gems and metal dealers, and 47 taxi drivers. There has been very little, really if any, uh, public comment that I have seen on this, and I think that's because most people don't know that this is coming down and, and this is going to create sticker shock. This is the kind of thing that causes inflation. Um, and and uh, uh, I think that it warrants more discussion and uh, I would like to see this uh, continued and discussed in tandem uh, with uh, a lengthening of, 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 the, t of the terms uh, because then we can uh, sell this easier to our constituency and the, and the public saying, Look, we're providing a value-added service, and we're also providing less strain uh, in operations uh, here at the city, especially when we're uh, dealing with a very, uh, very tight budget. So, I think that a 
um, a continuation of this is, is warranted uh, while we um, uh, discuss the uh, lengthening of the terms and that will also give an opportunity uh, for uh, s some uh, media coverage perhaps and also for people to have watched the uh, debates and perhaps um, uh, express, uh, express their concerns and provide ample opportunity for, for comment. So I am going to offer a motion uh, to um, continue this item to the uh, second council meeting in August. Okay, we have a substitute motion and a second to continue this to the second council meeting in September or August. in August. Very good, thank you. Discussion on that motion, and um, I'm going to start trying to reel this in a little bit. Uh, we've been given a lot of latitude. We will talk only about the continuation motion at this time, and then if you want to talk to the original motion, we will see where the continuation motion goes. So if you could please uh, uh, keep your discussion to the continuation motion only. Let's go to Alderman Ron Weifenbach. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. At the risk of educating myself and the public at, on the dais, I want to ask the chief question. Is it to the continuation motion? It would have a direct influence on whether I supported the continuation motion okay, or not. Please ask your question. My question would be, Chief, is this is a direct pass-through cost in regards to the DCI charges that Chief. we're incurring? Yes, sir. Uh, part of it is that there's a total cost increase of $35. $20 of that is pass-through. $15 of that is to help support the, the labor that's going to be required to process these applications, which includes fingerprinting, filling out this paperwork, and submitting electronically. Uh, with this volume of licenses, it's, it's a big deal. Okay. Alderman Weifenbach, you still have the floor, sir. I think I we got part of that, but why is there an increase in the labor involved, I guess, would be the question, Chief. Chief. Thank you. There is an increase in the work that's going to have to be put into background investigations now. We will go from a scenario today where we do one of these background investigations in uh, a few minutes, literally, to a t uh, scenario where it's going to take a uh, half hour. Mayor, if I would. Please go well, ahead. Just, so, and, and I guess in, I would consider, that, and that's directly in, because of the new changes required that we weren't meeting the requirements before by the state and that we have to meet the DCI requirements. That's going to require more labor on your part to meet that. Is that correct or not correct? That's correct. Thank you. Thank you. Let's go to Alderman Bill Okrepke. Thank you very much, Mr. Mayor. I think uh, J Jason would like to speak and maybe answer. Uh, so I'll defer to him first. Okay. Let's go to Jason Green, our city attorney. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I don't think it's been made explicit what is going to happen is that we will be required to do the fingerprints for folks that we don't do today. So there's a significant increase in the amount of labor that's going to be incurred by the police department in order to carry out the investigations. And I think that's the real reason for the fee that's going to be retained by the city. Okay, thank you. Let's go back to uh, Alderman Bill Okrepke. You have the floor, sir. Thank you very much, Mr. Mayor. Uh, is it the intention of the, uh, the motion maker uh, to postpone or, or to continue this 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 motion uh, so that we can put both of these together. Alderman Quaker? Yes, sir. Okay, so uh, it, it, does that need to go back to legal and finance for this for the, uh, for the this other portion? I mean, you got this portion that we're looking at today, but you also want to be talking about bringing forward what the terms of, of the licensing and the costs and the fees. Was that, was that part of that as well? Alderman Quaker? I mean, that, that would be logical. So would that need to go through legal and finance first before it comes to uh, city council again? Since we haven't looked at that second part. And if that's the case, is that going to give us enough time to put it all together so it can go through legal and finance? That was my question. And that's, that's the reason why the, uh, for the question of, for the Alderman continuation. Quaker. Well, I, you know, the, 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 I guess the, the first hurdle here is, is whether, we, whether or not we vote to continue to the second Public Works meeting, uh, or the, I'm sorry, getting second. confused. Second council meeting in August, and um, you know it, it makes sense to have it um, discussed uh, at, at legal and finance, um, but I, I think that that would be uh, automatic if we continued, if we continued it. 
So I think because traditionally ordinances come to the legal and finance committee meeting right prior to the council meeting where they're being heard. So that is the intent for it to make a stop off at legal and finance on the way back to council. Yeah. So so both of these both of these will come forward then. My understanding, the motion on the floor would bring this item only back to the city council. It would not go back to legal and finance. The motion on the floor is to continue the second reading to the second council meeting in August. Jason, is that your interpretation also? That would be the interpretation if this wasn't an ordinance. Typically with ordinances, except for zoning ordinances, anytime it's continued, it is returned to the legal and finance committee. But um, the council could certainly do something okay. different. Very good. I stand corrected. Thank you, Jason. If, if I may, Mayor. Please, go ahead. Uh, it's, it's that second portion of it that talks about the lengths of the of the licensing and the fees is that uh, and that was the second portion of it are we going to move this was the intent to move both of those together or just move the one and then deal with the other one later and that was the question i had for for alderman quaker yeah okay um i'm gonna let you answer the question but we're going to get back to the original question the question is whether or not to continue this and we seem to be a little bit sidetracked alderman quaker do you understand the question thank you mayor the the, the intent was for these to be brought forward as uh, as companions that okay. was the intent. Anything else? Mr. Ofkrafke, anything else? Okay, very good. Let's go to Alderwoman Deb Hadcock. Um, on the continuation motion, I don't think this should be continued. Again, it's going to come through, and the first part is going to be the same, and the second part on licenses and the fees, and that's what Jason was trying to tell us. So what you'd be doing is just delaying the process for what reason. Um, you can still change the second portion of the license and the fee at any time. This again is authorizing police department to collect fees for the performance of criminal background investigations on city employment applications. And basically it's saying that we can, if you guys want to change it on the portion, the licenses and how long it takes, Jason's telling us to do it on the second portion. The first portion here on number 44 is going to stay the same. I don't see any reason why we'd take it back and why we'd have to bring them together. You can still change this no matter what. This is the second reading. Um, it's going to stay the same. Thank you. Thank you. Let's go to there again. The motion on the floor is for continuation. We will deal with that question only. Let's go to Alderman Bob Robot. Thank you, Mayor. I have one quick question of, of Captain Allender and then one quick Let, comment. I'll ask the same question I asked of Alderman Weifenbach. Is it related to the motion on the floor? It's related to whether there is an issue that would cause us to think we may need to continue. So, okay. yes, it is. Please do. Um, the $15 that is uh, being added to the license fees to cover the cost of the officer who does the fingerprinting, is this going to re result in another FTE or is this just allocating a prorated portion of their time that would otherwise be spent on other things? I, and if you can go ahead and answer that. Chief. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, this is intended to uh, uh, result in a funded FTE. The, fact is we do not have the labor available to take on this duty it does, doesn't exist okay okay and with that I would just say I think there are sufficient questions here as to the interaction of these two ordinances as well as um, their effect that I think there's no harm in continuing them because they do go hand in hand anyway and I will just leave it at that thank you any further discussion motion on the floor is a continuation motion Let's go to Alderman Malcolm Chapman. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Just a question. Um, I understand how the two can be companion items, and, and that's fine if we want to bring them together. But um, I guess my question more along the lines for Sam was, you know, he said he had some concerns that people weren't aware of the, the fees going up. So is there some component in continuation that somehow now all of these people, taxi drivers, uh, everybody who's going to be impacted by this, is there some mechanism in place to um, alert them that these things are happening or will we come back here two months from now and it'll be the same thing? So I'm wondering how we're going to deal with that. Alderman Quaker, do you understand the question? Okay. Would you like to answer? Uh, well, I, I think the additional public comment, I also see uh, Scott writing furiously over there and so I'm, I'm sure that there'll be a uh, a, a story on a story on this as well, um, but uh, um, re but really, um, you know, I, I think it, it makes sense for these two items to be dis discussed at the same time. I, I guess I didn't I didn't have a, a specific proposal in mind to send out 
uh, letters or anything, I, I think that uh, um, hopefully there will be some more um, uh, media coverage uh, on this. But uh, the impact of this is quite broad, and so I, I think that uh, uh, there will be additional discussion when this, uh, when this comes back. And this will help uh, make the sale to the community if we can have these uh, two items come in at the same time. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you. Okay, seeing no further lights, the motion on the floor. Did you have a follow up? Okay. Let's go back to Alderman Chapman. And, and I didn't mean just to pointedly ask that question of Sam. I was really throwing it out for all of us if, I mean, he asked the, the first comment, made the first comment. Um, and I'm not going to make a substitute motion or anything, but, you know, we do have a fee committee. I'm just wondering if this made its way through that fee committee to have that discussion before we, we talked about fees or if we're going to continue it. I mean, let's get some meaningful work done on it. But yeah. I'm not going to make a substitute. Thank you. Motion on the floor is a substitute motion to continue to the first or to the second council meeting in August. Seeing no further lights. All those in favor signify by saying aye. aye. Opposed? Aye. No. Roll call, please. Kroger? No. Aye. Adcock? No. McCroy? No. Martinson? Aye. Weifenbach? Aye. Okrepke? Aye. Chapman? No. Quaker? Aye. Olson? No. <laughs> motion fails. Back to the original motion. Motion on the floor is for approval. Further discussion on that motion? See? Okay. If you double check, you have it for okay, right? Okay, let's go to Alderman Sam Quaker. Thank you, Mayor. Just to clarify, in terms of the, the fee, subsection B says um, $15 um, plus applicable sales tax for fingerprinting and forwarding to DCI. The applicant shall pay the $15 um, to the finance office at the time of the license application, the DC, at the time the application fee and the DCI fee are paid. Is there two fifteen dollars? So I'm not making it to thirty five, you know, even if I had fifteen plus fifteen. So where am I where's where's the thirty five coming in? Chief, go ahead. Thank you, Mayor. Thirty five comes in from an added cost from the DCI of twenty dollars. And then the fifteen dollar fingerprinting fee plus tax. So that's but the twenty dollars isn't in the ordinance. Go ahead, please, Sam. Thank you, Mayor. The twenty dollars isn't in the ordinance. We just got the fifteen in the ordinance, so we're, I don't see the twenty. Where is the, is the twenty in here? Mr. Mayor, let's go to Jason Green, City Attorney. Thank you. Subsection A refers to the DCI charge. And the reason that the $20 was not made explicit there is in case that charge is changed in the future, it's clear that whatever DCI charges for this service is what the applicant has to pay. The applicant also has to pay $15 plus tax to the city for the time and effort that it takes our um, staff to process the application. So, Mayor. Alderman Quaker, you still have the floor, sir. So, Chief Allender, are we, are, are we going to be fingerprinting every license holder every year chief thank you mayor all the in, in the end when the smoke clears whoever we're doing uh, new licenses on and renewals would get fingerprinted every year every oh. time that background process is completed so people's fingerprints aren't going to change unless they burn them off are they i mean i mean in all seriousness does, does this make sense chief i no <laughs> okay. We are, we are merely trying to uh, uh, cooperate with and adhere to the, the federal and state regulations on doing this. The DCI will not give criminal history on an applicant uh, without a set of fingerprints to make sure that that person is the one they're, get, they're giving the information on. If this person's a criminal, we are out in the field, we can run that right over the radio or whatever. But for background applications, it's very clear that's the only way they'll, sub they'll give us that information. Okay. Alderman Quaker, anything else? This is amazing. So you have to do a complete set of fingerprints every year for all of the hundreds of, of applications that were cited earlier. Chief? Yes, sir. Okay. Anything else? 
you, you know, I, I can. I think we could probably go along with sub, with with A, uh, with with subsection A, pass through the, the the DCI charge. But you know, I'd like to see if we could. Um, I'm not sure there's a support for it, but uh, I'm I'm going to try. I mean, let's let's scratch subsection B until we um, until we um, know whether we're going to increase the um, the the terms or, or not. But this has got to be one of the dumbest things I've seen in, in, in government to, to do a set of fingerprints on, on everybody every year because fingerprints by, by nature don't change. That's why they're called fingerprints. This, is, this doesn't make any sense. So, um, you know, I'm, I'm going to offer a, a motion to amend the ordinance to, uh, to remove uh, uh, Actually, if I could ask the city attorney a question before I ask it, it, is there a way that I can offer an amendment to subsection B to remove the hardwired dollar amount of, of $15 and leave that open like subsection A so that way um, that price could be changed without an ordinance amendment? Meaning after we have all the discussion and we could insert it without having to go through two additional readings. Jason. I think if you offered a um, motion to amend to change the language so it read that the council shall set the fee by resolution, you could accomplish what you're getting at. Um, and if I could expand just a little bit, Mayor, Go I'm going to suggest that you don't do that because if, if you recall when we first discussed this issue, we also indicated that we're going to approach the municipal league about. Um, supporting legislation that would allow us to go back to the way we used to do the background checks it would eliminate the need for this but until that's done we need this in place and obviously this is a burden on the police department so if you want to make the change um, I would suggest that you do it by council resolution okay Alderman Quaker so we have to leave the $15 in there but you can't change the $15 without Help me with the wording. Jason. If, I, if I offer a motion to change this to be a resolution how, for subsection B, how would I make that? What, my, what would my wording be? I would suggest that the wording be, in addition to the fee required by subsection A, the applicant shall also pay any fee adopted by the council by resolution. Okay. So that is my amendment. Okay, we will treat this as an amendment. Okay, we have a motion and a second to the amendment. Discussion on the amendment, and I'm going to start reeling this in because we seem to be getting way off track on some of these. We will discuss only the amendment, nothing other than the amendment. So, what, if the amendment passes, we can come back and debate the entire uh, ordinance as amended. So, uh, if you wish to talk to the amendment, uh, leave your light on. So, Alderman Wife and Back, did you want to talk to the amendment? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Yes, I do. I think okay. I can reel this in real quick with a, a financial equation, but I'm going to call on Mr. Preston to help me out here. So I'll pose a question to him. If we we're looking at passing this $85, $60 for renewals, okay? Now, in, in, in understanding that a second amendment may come forward that doesn't even require this to be renewed, renewed the second year. So if we don't, if we don't take the fingerprints the second year. We don't have any charges, so that's null and void. Null and voids the whole thing. So, I think we're uh, arguing a moot point if we if we pass this tonight, which I think is fair and favorable. And if we come back with an amendment that says we're not going to require this, but every two years, this whole discussion is a moot point. So I'm hoping this can reel it in for the council that mathematically, and uh, I'd pose that question to Mr. Preston. Does that make sense? Mr. Preston, you understand the question. I, I believe the question is is if if we would only um, do it require renewal every other year essentially yes that'd probably be half our cost if we're able to do that I guess I'd have to look the cost would be the same for the application it just matter if you do it every year or every other every other year so the cost within the resolution would read the same 
Okay, I missed, must have missed the question. I thought my, my question, Mr. Preston, would be if today I go in to, to apply for a security license, my first year on initial application, it's $85. Okay. Right. The second year I come in, it's $60. We're arguing about the $15 for the fingerprinting, correct? Now, if I come in the second year, if, if, if in the future, if the, if the council amends this and says we only are going to require every two years, the second year goes away. So we have $85 the first year and zero dollars the second year, 85 plus zero equals 85. So is that, I guess that's my point. I mean, we're arguing a moot point. If we're going to come back and change the, the length of the license, it doesn't matter if we charge $100. We charge $100 this year and zero next year, that's $100. That, go ahead. Yeah, the math would be so, correct there. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> okay. okay. Let's, there again, the motion is a motion to amend, and we're going we're gonna to wrap this up. We've been talking about this for about, oh, about 35 minutes now. Um, let's go to Alderman Bob Robot. Thank you, Mayor. This amendment makes sense, really, whichever side of the issue you're on, because it allows flexibility to adjust the additional amount that we charge to reflect the additional cost to the city which could also be an increase if need be to, uh, to recoup our costs. And I think it makes great sense to put that flexibility in there and uh, allow for further consideration along with the other motion. And I think this, this is a good idea that's the result and benefit of full discussion and not just uh, doing our homework in advance and not discussing it from the dais. And I'm glad we've had this discussion whichever way this goes. I think it's a great amendment though and then we can continue the discussion um, at legal and finance when the other ordinance comes through. Thank you. Let's go to Alderwoman Deb Hadcock. Call the question, please. Do we have a Senator. second? Okay, the question has been called. Are there any objection to calling the question? The objection. If not, we go directly to the motion on the floor, which is the amended motion. Everyone clear on that motion? All those in favor of the amendment signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? Aye. No. Roll call, please. Aye. No. McCroy? No. Martinson? Aye. Leifenbach? McCricky? Aye. Matlin? No. Quaker? Aye. Olson? No. Kroger? No. Motion fails on a five before vote. We are back to the original motion, please. Any further discussion on that motion? Let's go to Alder, Alderwoman Deb Hadcock. I'll call the question again. Okay. Second. We have a motion and a second to call the question. Any objection to calling the question? If not, we go originally to the motion on the floor is for approval. Everyone clear on that motion? It's been so long, Mayor. What was the, what was, what's the motion again? Motion is for approval of the, of the second reading of Ordinance 5369. Okay, very good, thank you. All those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion passes, let's take a roll call. Adcock? Aye. McCroy? Aye. Martinson? Aye. Weifenbach? Aye. Kretke? Aye. Batman? Aye. Quaker? Olson? Aye. Kroger? Aye. Oh, come on. Robert? Aye. <laughs> so the motion passes unanimously. Okay. <laughs> Very good. We're on to item 45, please. Karen, can you read in item 45, please? Item 45. Item 45, second reading of ordinance number 5404 to create a sidewalk cafe permit by amending subsection 12.20.020E of the Rapid City Municipal Code. And I move approval. Second. We have a motion and a second for approval. Any discussion on that motion? Any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion passes. Thank you, everyone. Uh, let's go to Alderwoman Deb Hadcock. Just want to thank some of the people that helped with this um, state law mayor. Um, the state law was helped by Jason Green, Mayor Hanks, and uh, Bill Krepke, or Bill Krepke, sorry, Bill, I gave you credit. Um, Chapman, Malcolm Chapman, 
and uh, Yvonne Taylor, Brian Dreyer, and then the ones that helped get the ordinances done were Anna Vandergriff, Dan Seffner, Bob Fuchs, John Brewer, and uh, Vicki Fisher, and Mike Shad. And we thank everybody that helped get this done, and we really appreciated their help. So thank you again to all that got this done downtown. Uh, looks like our using some of the ordinances now, but um, it should be successful. Thank you again, Council. Thank you. We are on to Growth Management Department items, Legal and Finance Committee items, number 46, please. Item number 46, deny a request to authorize Mayor and Finance Officer to sign directed trust agreement with MG Trust Company, LLC, regarding the city's 457B plan. And I would move. I think the applicant wished to withdraw, so I, the, uh, the motion should be to acknowledge the applicant's uh, wish to withdraw. That's, That's correct, Mayor. Okay. That would be my motion. Okay. We, have, we have a motion and a second to acknowledge the applicant's uh, desire to withdraw this uh, request. Any discussion on that motion? Any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. aye. Opposed? Motion passes. Item number 47, please. Authorization for the mayor and finance officer to sign amendment to the contract for private development tax increment district number 65 between Plum Creek Development LLC and the city of Rapid City. I would move approval. Second. We have a motion and a second for approval. Discussion on that motion? Any discussion? Let's go to Alderman Sam Quaker. Thank you, Mayor. Um, and I have a question for the applicant um, or the applicant's engineer. Um, I did not support this um, TIF originally. However, it is my understanding that uh, this um, amendment uh, actually reduces the cost of the taxpayers and um, improves the timing of the project um, being completed. And I would uh, ask uh, for clarification uh, from the applicant or the applicant's um, representative whether um, that is correct. Okay, let's go to Mr. Shaffey. Good evening, Mr. Mayor, again, and council members. The uh, phasing of the project will allow for a delay of the construction or phasing it as it goes, which will reduce the amount of uh, financing or interest accrued on the, te on the TEF, which will reduce the final uh, interest cost for the entire TEF. This is estimated to be in the neighborhood of about $200,000. Okay. Thank you. Alderman Quaker, anything else? Okay, very good. Let's go to Al Alderman Ron Weifenbach. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, for the opportunity. I'd, I'd like to thank my teachers on this project, Marcia Elkins, Hanny Shaffey, Karen Bowman, and Tom Johnson. I did my homework on this, and, and, and I believe that this is a good item. It does, it does phase out the project, and, and it does save the taxpayers money, and it also uh, gives the, the folks in the Elks Country Estates uh, a huge... Uh, uh, ability to sleep at night, understanding that they're going to have a second access out of there, uh, which is Minnesota Street. It'll be stubbed in and uh, phased in as, as, as the project grows, uh, allowing for a large commercial development in this area, which is well needed in the south part of town. And uh, I think that this thing will, because of the adjustments, I wasn't for it before when it first came, came through. Um, and uh, I, I believe we're signing on to a, a good item here and that's going to pay off quickly and, and save the taxpayers money in the long run and, and provide safety for the people in the Elks Village. Again, I'd like to thank those particular people. and, and I, Thank you. Thank you. Let's go to Alderwoman Deb Hadcock. I'd just like to thank uh, Ron Weifenbach for doing his homework. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay, motion on the floor is for approval. I'm going to get out of the middle. And uh, any further discussion? Let's go to Malcolm Chapman. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I, uh, I was opposed to the creation of this TIF uh, when we started this process in addition to the, the project plan. But, um, you know, the, the TIF is in place or the TID is in place. So uh, I, I think what I, try, what I tried to look at was overall, I mean, where we are now and does this save the taxpayers money? And I believe that it does. And I would agree with my colleagues that have said that at some level this is good, but I, I have to express some disappointment in that the carrot that was dangled out there in the beginning was this carrot of Minnesota Street going all the way through. And I understand that it makes no sense to, to post surety or agree to do Minnesota Street all the way through if there's not some development out there to pay for that. I, I understand that. 
So I, I also understand that this is a balancing act of resources versus finances and, and all. And I think I fall, down, fall on the side that this is a good thing. But I, I, again, I have to express my disappointment that we're not going to get Minnesota Street all the way through. There's no guarantee of that. And there's no guarantee in phase two or phase three or whatever we're calling it that there's surety there to uh, ensure that we do that. Um, so I'm holding my nose as I vote yes for this. Motion on the floor is for approval. Any further discussion? Any further discussion? Seeing none. All those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion passes. Item 48, please. Authorization for the mayor and finance officer to sign amendment to the contract for private development tax increment district number 65 between Dennis Anstra Real Estate Holdings, LLC, and the city of Rapid City. My motion is for approval. Second. We have a motion second for approval. Any discussion on that motion? Any discussion? Let's go to Alderwoman Deb Hatcock. If we wanted to add in phase three that they put up any kind of surety to finish the road because that was the promises to finish um, all of Minnesota, um, how would we do that if we were to do that, Marcia? Marcia, let's go to Jason Green, city attorney. If we posted surety on phase three, which would be the second half of Minnesota to ensure that this would be done um, still, because at this point, if I'm correct, Jason, this only um, puts them in the position that they only have to finish the first half, phase one and phase two for $5 million. It doesn't put it in a position where he has to finish phase three. Am I correct? Jason? I believe that's correct, but I'm going to defer to Mr. Landine from my office because he's been working extensively with these agreements. Mr. Landine, do you understand the question? Uh, yes. I mean, the city council could, but the request to amend it is coming from the developer, and essentially what they've said is because that the current or the prospective buyer has decided not to proceed with their development, they don't know if within the time frame there's going to be any development out there, and, and the point was not building the road. But I would probably defer to Mr. Shaffey as far as their willingness to post surety for that, that portion of the street. I think the idea was if there's development out there, we're going to build it. If there's not, then, then it may not get built. It wasn't the agreement, if I could talk maybe to Mr. Shaffey, ask him a question. Go ahead, please. Wasn't the agreement, Mr. Shaffey, to do all of Minnesota, and that's what the city council was sold on, also on second access and getting that road because it was a major arterial, as I recall, um, needed to be pushed through because it was a major issue out there to have the whole road, not just half. So based on that information, um, can I ask you how or when for our information that we would get assurance that that third phase would be done without any kind of surety or anything. Mr. Shabby. Good evening, Mayor and Council Members again. Uh, the current agreement that was approved previously actually does not require surety for the <coughs> last phase, you know, of Minnesota Street. The idea is to ensure construction of Minnesota Street in the future and the insurance for that is actually to allow for an H lot or require an H lot from the property owners to be provided to the city as soon as possible, actually the times are listed in the agreement, to ensure that Minnesota Street can be built in case the developer does not build it. Build it. Uh, the obtaining a surety for the next four years or the next three years to build Minnesota Street or the rest of Minnesota Street, which is the last phase of Minnesota Street, since the other development is not going to go in right away, would be almost near cost prohibitive because of the banking system. Because it's really hard to bond for more than two years or provide a letter of credit for more than two okay, years. Okay, but um, wasn't the original was for $10 million and now it's only going to be posted for $5 million. So with, without trying to delay this or say anything that I, I know you're not putting up the five million to do the second half. To me, the, the signs are that you're only going to build this half unless development occurs in the other half, and I understand that. But I guess I, I will be approving this tonight, but I'm with Malcolm. I'll be holding my nose on this for this, the, the, the issue of you said you were going to build the whole road and why you were going to put the whole road up, and 
at this point you're building half and I know it makes sense so at this point um, because things happen but long story short um, promises should be kept and and in this case it doesn't seem like they are but the first half is fine let's go to Alderman Malcolm Chapman thank you mr. mayor and thank you for giving me some latitude on that last one to really be talking about the item now um, um, I, I said what I had to say as it relates to that I'm gonna vote approval I'm gonna vote yes on this uh, I do appreciate the fact that we did get the H lot so we the city does have that right away if it goes through I hope that tons of development occurs out there so that um, you know the applicants can build the rest of Minnesota Street and we can finally get that through so um, I say to my colleagues let's vote approval and be done thank you in further discussion seeing none all those in favor signify by saying aye aye opposed motion passes thank you everyone item number 49 Item number 49 comes forward as a recommended no change in the email usage by the City Council. How, okay, however, do, do, well, we have a motion. Do we have a second? You don't have a motion yet either. No, you do. I do have a motion here. Second. second. Motion is for approval. Okay, now Alderman Ol or Alderwoman Olson, you, you will have the floor. Thank you. Since our discussion at Legal and Finance, I've had additional um, consideration of this and other conversations with Jason and I am I, I would wish to consider the possibility of the unmoderated um, list and perhaps if Jason could give us some additional um, information I would offer then a motion a substitute motion to do the unmoderated list as the way of handling the e use of email okay let's go to Jason Green I, uh, would you like me to present the the PowerPoint that I did for legal and finance? Is that is that what we're getting at? Yes. Before I, I'm going to ask the council, is that the this is a little bit unusual? Does the council wish to? Let's I tell you what. Let's get a substitute motion. See if we have a second before okay. we go over that direction. Did you, you? I would make a substitute motion that we convert the council group to an unmoderated list serve. Okay. We have a motion and a second. Discussion on that. Um, you know, <laughs> we can see it, but you're in, in typically in, in uh, situations like this, I wouldn't be asking us try to change the recommendation. I would ask for a continuation mo motion back to legal and finance. So, okay. but it, whatever the desire of the council is, I you know, it, it's one of those things where. We have a recommendation going forward, and if we're going to change that, we probably should send it back to the committee. But Jason Green, do you, are you able to do a PowerPoint? Okay, very quickly, please. It's actually on our, it's linked on our agenda too. Jason, how are you coming? Should have it right here. This is the, the presentation I made to the Legal and Finance Committee, and it grew out of the presentation I originally made on um, instant messaging and, and that discussion. If you recall, part of my recommendation was to direct me to present options to deal with the email issue. On this slide, I've described three different functions or ways that ma that email comes to the council there's the mass mailing which is essentially a distribution list and I don't think there's any question that that's fine where we get into potential problems is when we have discussion strings among or to a quorum of the council the other way that happens is by a serial message which is an email that's forwarded from one council member to another to another until you have a quorum of the council each of those instances have been found to be violations of meeting laws in other jurisdictions. South Dakota has no law directly on point, as I pointed out to you earlier. That includes statutes, case law, attorney general's opinions, and open meeting commission opinions. But other states have addressed email outside the context of public meetings very directly. Um, California, Nevada, Florida, Arizona, and Washington <coughs> 
have all found that open meeting law violations can occur when council members email each other. In those states, it requires messages that are at least sent to a quorum of the council. Florida goes much further and says that two council members exchanging information by email violates the open meeting law. Virginia is the only state I've found to address the issue that did not find an open meeting law violation. And what Virginia said was, our statutes don't directly address it, so we're not going to address it either. We're going to leave it to the legislature. They're clearly in the minority. <coughs> I've identified several options for consideration by the council. The first is make no change, and that was the recommendation that was forwarded to you by the Legal and Finance Committee. Um, the next two I don't believe are, are practical, but they are alternatives you could consider. Prohibit aldermen from communicating with each other by email entirely, or prohibit aldermen from communicating with the quorum of the council by email. The problem with those, obviously, is that they hinder your ability to communicate with each other. And the second one, the, which is the third bullet on prohibiting communication with the quorum of the council, can still happen without any fault of an alderman that originates a message. Um, this, the last two, I believe, are your best alternatives, maintaining a log of all messages that are sent to the council group that currently exists. However, Mr. Cook, your IT um, division manager is informed me that that is technologically difficult and will ultimately require a lot of storage space that's expensive. The final bullet up there, which is my recommendation, is to convert the council group to a non-moderated listserv. And, and I need to describe a listserv. You're all familiar with the council group, I assume. There's a listing where you can simply send one message. You type in council group in the two line and it gets to all 10 council members, and I believe the mayor also gets those messages. That's kind of like a listserv. A listserv requires someone to actually subscribe to the list to say, I want to receive messages. And it comes in two varieties. The moderated listserv is what it sounds like. There's somebody who's playing gatekeeper. You have to get their permission to send something to the distribution list. An unmoderated listserv works much like your council group. It, you send a message to it, it goes out to everyone. There are a couple of caveats that I would suggest if you go the unmoderated listserv route. Allow anybody that wants to to subscribe to receive the messages, but limit access to the group, that is, limit the ability to send messages to the group, to the council, and to the staff. That will prevent uh, the, the list from getting clogged with viruses and other unwanted email that may violate other laws. I believe that the unmoderated listserv is the best option, although none of them are perfect. It's the best option because it provides transparency that the council has indicated that you want to provide and anybody that's interested can then get those messages. We don't have to maintain storage of those here at City Hall, but there's a record of everything that'll go through the listserv. One caveat here, there are obvious ways to evade this, the, the listserv issue. So it will follow the council members to pay attention to emails that you get from other council members and note when there is a quorum for council members on the message and it will fall to you to forward that to the listserv in order to make this process work. From the standpoint of the staff, staff can still use the, the council group as a distribution list. We simply have to be aware that that message will go out to the public as a whole. So for example, I couldn't send a privileged message to the council because others would have access to it. And the recommendation there is the council group as an unmoderated listserv and I'll stand for any questions. Okay, Alderman Olson, you still have the floor, ma'am. And there's a motion on the floor which I've made to there adopt. There's a substitute motion on the floor. To adopt the unmoderated list. It yes. seems to me like after visiting with Jason and having further time to think about all of the options presented that this is the best one and um, provides the level of transparency that I'm comfortable with and yet still continu continues our ability to use e email in an infor informational way. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Let's go to Alderman Sam Quaker. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, I, I support the uh, concept uh, of this. Uh, I, I do think that uh, uh, approving this would uh, increase the ability of not only the, the public to uh, access uh, transmissions sent to a quorum of the uh, council, but it would also 
assist the council as, uh, as well. Uh, one of the things that was accomplished with the uh, ordinance that was passed a few weeks ago is, is that opening up the uh, Microsoft uh, Outlook uh, window in the meetings is now is prohibited. And if we did this, that would allow uh, council members uh, during the meetings to, to uh, access that listserv and see that very import, important public comment and see that uh, public, public comment because you wouldn't be able to send during, I'm, I'm seeing shaking heads. Can we go to Jason Green? Why don't we go to Jason yeah. Green and then I'll come back to you okay. all a little quicker. Mayor, this uh, action by the council would essentially be a resolution. It would not alter the substance of the ordinance that you previously approved that prohibits the use of those electronic communication mediums during council meetings. So you still would not be able to access the email through the Outlook window during the meeting. This, this policy would really apply only outside the public meetings when you are using email and using it for legitimate purposes. Okay. Alderman Quaker, you have the floor. Then I'd like to suggest that we consider another alternative which may require a continuation, and that is, is that we publish these, meeting, these uh, um, emails to a web page, which, which you could then not um, send and receive, you would have uh, access to. And I think that, you know, Jim's not here tonight. We probably need to have more discussion on this. Whichever way we go, there's a risk, and that's one of the, the, the risks with uh, listservs, and that is the spammers these days are harvesting, uh, with malicious code, harvesting the, um, the listservs for email address for spam lists. And so I, um, you know, I, I support the concept here, but uh, I, I think it would be better and safer to do um, some sort of a P, uh, PDF posting or, or uh, web posting uh, to allow freer access and also protect uh, people's email addresses um, from spammers because the last thing you want is, is for people's email addresses to be open and accessible out on the internet because that will have a, a chilling impact on, uh, on, on public comment if, people, if people's uh, emails start being used for for spam because they sent an email to their governing body. So I, I think we probably need to continue this to get an official opinion from IT on this. Okay, thank you. Let's go to Patty Martinson. Yeah. I just have a concern that when we receive um, emails from private individuals, it may be directed to the council group or to individual council members. They may not appreciate it being made public to other individuals, other citizens. I'm concerned about that, and that needs to be addressed because if you're making it public, you're going to make it public to everybody, and maybe the citizens don't want that to happen. And there's no way to really to screen that out unless the aldermen themselves, you know, censor themselves as far as or ask permission of the private citizen if they would like to make that public. I'm going to go to Jason Green. He had a cop. Go ahead. A, a couple of comments, Mayor. With regard to citizens emailing council members, a citizen can email up to five council members at one time and that message does not have to go to the council group. So there is some inherent protection for your ability to communicate with citizens through your uh, city email account without having that made public. It's only when there's a quorum of council that receive that message that it has to be made public. Um, and in regard to um, um, IT's opinion on this, I visited, visited extensively with Jim Cook about the, the second two options, the saving the messages on a web accessible page or the unmoderated listserv. And I can tell you he supports the unmoderated listserv. The other option he <coughs> sees as technologically difficult and not as valuable. Ma'am, you still have the floor. You, no. Anything else? Um, I'm still concerned that even if the aldermen themselves have the right, you know, the option to forward and they still need permission from the actual citizen itself, whether or not they want that, you know, spread out to, in the public arena. So that still doesn't make a difference whether that they, the individual private citizen may not want that to be on the website publicized to every other citizen in Rapid City. Yeah. Even though the aldermen themselves may have that choice, I would still like permission from the individual citizen for that to be done. Jason? And every individual alderman can make that choice not to Not forward. on behalf of the private citizen. Yes, in, in, each individual alderman can decide that 
if you get a message that's just addressed to you or to only a total of five aldermen, that does not have to be forwarded. Okay. But, but I think I know where uh, the alderwoman's going. If any item is sent to the council group and without the knowledge of the sender, it would be posted under this scenario, open for public inspection. Is that fair? Yeah, I'm kind of worried that might chill public people if they feel like their email will be distributed to, you know, for the eyes of every other citizen. Yep. Very good. Jason, did you have a follow up? Just just a comment on the other the other side of that coin is that I think there's an argument that could be made that if someone is communicating with the entire council at one time, that's something that should be made public because that's akin to what happens in the council chambers. Okay, very good. I'm gonna go to Alderman Deb Hadcock and I and I'm not sure exactly where we're gonna go with this tonight. I just I'm not sure that we're ready to act on this, but let's uh, take a couple more comments. Let's go to Alderwoman Deb Hadcock. I think um, the bottom line was we said no change. So at this point, how many violations do we have um, that we needed to make this change, Jason, at this point? Jason? There has never been an occasion where an alderman has been charged criminally with violating the open meeting law as a result of email that I'm aware of in South Dakota. I don't know of an opinion from the Open Meeting Commission. However, in my experience with the council, I've identified messages that I believe are problematic. Okay, so to me, based on some of the information that I have heard, it seems like we can on this police ourselves and if there needs to be a change because there's uh, definite violations of this, then I think we can change it. But based on the information that I know and, and have been listening to, I think people know that already, so it seems to make sense. The other instance that we had was <coughs> on instant messaging, and because of that, uh, Ron Kroger stated it well, that there was an issue, we couldn't police it, and that's why we made the changes into an ordinance. At this point, if that's what that needs to be done, we can do that, but again, I would suggest that we do no change until we find um, violations of this council doing something that they shouldn't be doing. Very good. Motion on the floor, I'm gonna repeat the motion. It is a substitute motion to approve the recommendation from the city attorney's office to convert the council group to address an unmoderated listserv. Is that correct, Jason? Yes. Okay. We will, we've been, uh, we're gonna hold the discussion very strictly to this and I know I've been giving everybody an awful lot, lot of latitude tonight, but that we're going to stop that right now so uh, otherwise we'll be here till three o'clock in the morning let's go to Alderman Bob Hurlbut thank you mayor and as you just suggested I, I think this is probably got enough issues that we don't have our arms around yet tonight to decide tonight I think we need to consider this as a protection method for us so that we are not accused of violating open meeting laws by simply um, communicating by email. Um, I think the cost issue is something that needs to be considered. I think Ms. Martinson uh, raises a good issue about whether this has a chilling effect on people's ability to communicate with the council. Um, I'm concerned with how it's going to be linked to where you know, I'd like to be able to access it on the city's website and, and I'd like to even see it indexed by agenda items so that the public doesn't just see it what appears to be a great big blog but instead they can go to their specific issue and see what emails uh, pertain to that. Um, so I think there's enough issues here that, that we should consider this. I, I support the concept though as a matter of protection for us and, and uh, you know, if we're doing too much homework behind the scenes, uh, this will reveal that. And uh, <laughs> you know, the, the doing the homework behind the scenes does cut both ways and I think we need to be careful whether that's being done by email by instant messaging, by agenda review meetings, or whatever council communications there are. I think if I've spoken with five council people on an issue, even at different times, I've now had the opportunity to try to build six vote consensus and quorum. And I think we need to look at all of the ways in which we can make ourselves transparent and protect ourselves from the accusation that we're not. And so I would recommend that we do consider this uh, or uh, continue this for further consideration. And I do support the concept. I, I want to be able to have those published so that people can have the most information possible. And I want to be able to look at it on the agenda while I'm at the meeting since I can't open my emails to do that. So I, 
I urge my colleagues to just give this some time and make sure we do this not rashly but uh, responsibly. Thank you. Thank you. Let's go to Alderman Weifenbach, who has not spoken on this topic yet. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I have a, I have a simple question. Yep, please answer. To, uh, to our city attorney. It, is our email not public knowledge? I mean, these are public computers, taxpayer computers. I mean, it's taxpayer email. Everything that we do is, I mean, is it not public knowledge? That, that's the, what you're alluding to here. Jason Green. In South Dakota, the only records that are public records are those that are required to be kept open by statute. And there is no statute that requires your email to be open. So the answer to that question is no. Okay. Alderman Weifenbach, anything else? Thank you. Okay. Let's go to, let's see, I think everyone, let's see, I'm going to go to Alderman Sam Quaker. I do not believe you have spoken. There you go. Alderman Sam Quaker. Actually, I did speak, but that was a long time ago. So, um, <laughs> Jason, question for you. If, if, if someone sends an email to the mayor's office saying, please print and distribute to the council members, um, is, is that a, this, the same thing? Jason? I don't believe that's the same thing. And I think the distinction is that with electronic communication mediums, and in this case, email in particular, it's the speed with which it happens that, that makes the difference. I don't know of any case where there's been an open meeting violation found because somebody wrote a letter to all 10 council members and a, another council member responded to all 10. That's, that's where you get in trouble. It's not with receipt of the, ma the message to all of you. It's when council members start having those discussions among themselves. Okay. Alderman Quaker, still on the floor. Well, I, uh, I, I think, you know, I think cost, uh, is somewhat of a, a factor and should be explored, but uh, I, I'm really concerned uh, about the about the the spamming uh, portion uh, of this. And I guess I would like to, you know, I support the concept of this, but I, I really think that we need to get um, a, an answer from Jim on on his thoughts and what on on what this could mean in terms of 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 spamming and, and the ability to harvest people's email addresses for for. Um, Spam lists, and I had to tell you that I had a um, um, a number of months ago. I had an email from a, a city employee, and it was sent to to a council group, and um, I forwarded it to um, the the department head, and cc'd the person who'd sent it to me, and and they weren't happy with me that I'd forwarded onto the department head, and it wasn't. I I think this I think this is important, Mayor. This is an I know, important but I, discussion. I also and I mentioned earlier that we were going to stay with the topic. We've really drifted an awful long ways tonight. So if if you could just wrap it up and try and keep I, it closer. Well, I I tried to I'd give like everybody to, a warning. I would like to uh, offer a motion 